Well, happy Friday, everyone. You know what that means, another live care Q&A. My name is Ron Henry, and I'm here to help answer your lawn care questions. If this is the first time that you've discovered us, welcome. Happy to have you here. The way this works is super, super simple. On your screen, you're gonna see a chat box. In there, you enter your question, comment, concern of the day. Sometimes I have the answer, sometimes I do not. But either way, we have a great time talking about Long here. Guys, this has been a hectic, hectic week for me. I can't tell you. I really look forward to the live stream because it's a great way for me to decompress and just kind of hang out with you guys, talk about grass and challenges and things that you have going on in your lawn this time of year and things you plan to do on your lawn this time of year. So it's a great time. I know it's not a ton going on this, this time of the season, but it's a good time to you know get your soil testing done and just figure out your plan of action for next year year. All right, so let's see what we have in the live stream tonight. We got Mr. Gundy Grasshopper leading it off saying, hey, Ron and all, thanks for looking at my lawn pictures this past weekend. I was freaking out. Much appreciated, brother. So if you guys are wondering what Gunny was dealing with, something that a lot of you guys that have warm season grass are dealing with this time of year, he had the, some leopard stripe action. So if you guys want to see what, what Gunny sent me, this is a picture of his lawn. If you look in there, you can see the telltale leopard stripes, the telltale spotting of a Bermuda grass lawn that is about to go dormant or is in the process of going dormant. And he was wondering, hey, do I have a like mass disease outbreak? What's going on? Should I be worried? Should I be concerned? Not really. I mean, it looks, it looks a lot worse than it is. It's just grass doing what grass does. Nothing really to be concerned about, just uh, grass starting to go dormant. Uh, I had that in my front lawn, uh, you know, about, about a month ago. And the back lawn didn't get any of that. So it's just uh, it's just Mother Nature, just the lawn doing its thing. Nothing to be concerned about uh, at all. All right, next up we got Brian Bales with the, with the first question around grubs. He says, 
Ron, what do you suggest for grub worms in Bermuda grass? Well, there's a couple of different options for that, Brian. So it depends on whether you did want just, just an insecticide or if you want an insecticide and fungicide combination, I'll show you some offerings that we have on the Golf Course Lawn Store. We can visit there right now real quick. So you go to golfcourselawn.store. I've got it pinned in the comment section uh, there on your screen to so make it easier for you to get to. Once there, once there, you go to shop and then go to fungicide insecticide and under there, you've got a couple of different options. So if all you want is just a straight insecticide, I'm a huge fan of acelaprin. Reason being, it kills grubs, army worms, any kind of turf caterpillar for the most part. And the nice thing is that while it's very, very effective against the bugs that damage our lawns, it doesn't harm the invertebrates and insects that we want to keep. So pollinators, bees, um, earthworms, doesn't really um, have a negative impact against them. We have it in, in a couple of forms. You have it in a granular here and also in a liquid form in the form of a celeprint SC. Um, so if you prefer you know, to spray your insecticides, it comes in a little four ounce, has a built-in measuring, uh, built measuring cup here to makes it really easy to, to figure this out. As far as coverage, it's the same for both of them. So regardless of whether you go with the liquid or the granular, you're gonna get the same coverage, amount of coverage, around 21,000 square feet, depending on application rate. But if you apply this at the 0.2 rate that I suggest, you get around the same coverage as the 25 pound bag. In the description for both of these, or for the granular, you're gonna see there's a video that tells you how I like to use it. There's different ways of using a celeprin, but I'll show you how I like to do it. And for the liquid, it's the same thing. There's a video that shows how I measured out the rates that I like to use and my thinking behind that. So that is just, that's the options if all you want is a straight insecticide. If you want a combination fungicide and insecticide product, there is Caravan G, also an excellent product. Caravan is also effective against grubs. Well, the insecticide in it is more correctly is effective against grubs, but doesn't have anything really for army worms. So if um, I'd only go with Caravan really if you are looking for a combination fungicide and insecticide product. If you're looking for strictly an insecticide, a celeprin is a, is a better choice. It's a better choice. It takes care of more bugs, targets more bugs, and um, got my, my wall coming apart here. I'll have to fix that later. Actually, I'll just take it down now and I'll fix it later. Um, yeah, a, a celeprin is a better choice as far as uh, just a straight insecticide goes. So it really depends on which way you wanna go. Um, for me, I would I would go opt for a celeprin. What we tend to find, right, is, is unless a person this time of year is dealing with a fungus, uh, some kind of lawn disease, um, most people tend to use Caravan in the springtime, like the May June time frame is when they tend to use it. But again, it just really depends on on what your what your goals are. Either one of them is gonna is gonna serve your purposes from a standpoint of dealing with um, grubs in Bermuda grass. So great question. Hope that helps. If you need anything else, definitely let me know. All right, next up we got Mr. Timothy Wolf in the house. He was saying, uh, hey Ron and everyone, happy Friday, happy Friday. Timothy, thanks for coming to hang out, sir, appreciate you. And then uh, we, have, we have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Alexander Lee in the house saying, what's up Ron Henry and lawn care community. Thanks for coming to hang out, uh, Alex. I appreciate you, sir, taking some time out of your Friday evening. I know how you guys like, you know, just like to take Friday and relax, but glad that you took a little bit of time to come say hi to the golf course lawn squad. So Timothy Wolf is up. He has a question similar to a question we got earlier. He says, hey, Ron, the grass is finally going to sleep in the great state of Texas. My grass is looking like a leopard print. Should I be concerned? Nope, nope, not at all. So I'm getting that question quite a bit this time of year. So you saw Gunny's picture. Uh, there's another picture here from last week. So some of you guys will have grass that looks like that. Nothing to be concerned about at all. It's just Bermuda grass going dormant. Nothing to be uh, to be concerned about, uh, Timothy. It's just uh, it's just just the lawn going dormant. It's, what you what you tend to find is when you get the first cold snap, which at this point I'm sure you guys have experienced that in Texas. Uh, then that's when if your lawn is going to do this this uh, leopard print op, um, um, pattern, that is typically when it's going to happen after the first real uh, uh, cold hits the uh, hits the lawn. So some lawns get it, some lawns don't, but it's nothing to be concerned about, nothing to be concerned about at all. All right, we got our first super chat of the evening from Mr. Robert Majoros. Thank you so much, Robert, really do appreciate you. Super chat received. Thank you for all the love and support. And guys, I'm gonna do a better job of it. Because you are our first super chat of the evening, Robert, you are the show sponsor. So let me get this edited up here and get you on the screen. Robert, Robert Majoros, your name, 
in lights for whatever that means to you. All right, so saved and we'll get it up right now. There we go, sweet. Pretty awesome, sir. Thank you so much for the super chat. I really, really do appreciate it. Really appreciate the support. All right, next up, we have Papa Mo's Low uh, in the house saying, hey, Ron and everyone, what's going on, Papa Mo's Low? Thanks for coming to hang out. And guys, I got a picture from, we're just getting started in the show, but I want to show you guys a picture that I got from a viewer here right before the show started. He wanted to um, show off how his overseeded Bermuda is looking. Now, granted, it's not something that I've ever done, but I, listen, when, when a lawn looks good, a lawn looks good. You can't, you can't hate, you can't hate on a great looking lawn. So let me show you some pictures we got from Doug here. So this is overseeded Bermuda grass. Take a look at that. That, man, that... I almost wish I'd done it now. Look, that's solid. It's clean, looking really good, right? So that's one picture, picture one, and then this is picture two. Stripe action is on point. The lawn looks nice and thick, sir. Compared to all the other lawns, you're definitely dominating the neighborhood. You can see all the lawns there in the background, how they're dormant, checking out, going to sleep. But no, not Doug's lawn. He is that guy. He's that guy. You're that guy in the neighborhood. So congrats on all the hard work. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Lawn looks great, and you know you got to keep us posted as far as in the springtime how you transition away from the ryegrass overseed back to Bermuda. Again, the only advice I'd give you is make sure you plan some time to spray that out in March timeframe so that your Bermuda will come out of dormancy and look super awesome. All right, so Robert says he's up next. He says, just tuned in just to listen and watch the intro. Very cool. Howdy, y'all. Thanks, man. I'm glad a lot of you guys really like that intro. I mean, it's... I. It was a fun project over the course of this past season to, 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 to put together, and I think I'm going to keep it. You know, I had a couple different versions of it, and that one is the one that I decided to go forward with, so I'm glad that you guys are enjoying it. All right, next up is Michael C. He says, Ron, he says, Ron, uh, love the content. Is there anything you can put down now for cool season grass that will eliminate weeds for the next year? Thanks. Uh, sure, Michael. So there's a couple different options. So there is pre-emergent. You can apply pre-emergent on cool season grass. The time for doing that, the optimal time for doing that would have been a couple of months ago. However, like still doing it now is better than not doing it at all. So let me show you a couple of options in that space. So we'll go back to the store, go to shop. And this time we're going to click on weed killer. And then when it comes to pre-emergent, um, there's a there's prodiamine, there's dithiapine, there's a couple different options here. So let me go over to page two. I think we still have some of that in stock. We do. All right. So for cool season grass this time of year, I would I would try and um, lean you towards prodiamine. Now, if you have a smaller lawn, uh, you could go with this little five ounce. That's gonna that's gonna cover um, for Bermuda. It's like six thousand square feet. For cool season grass, is a lot more. Like the the application rate for cool season grass is much more. Yeah, so there you go. So like nine thousand square feet thereabouts for um for cool season grass. Uh, again, depends on the rate that you apply it at. Uh, this is a good option if you're fine. If you're okay with mixing a liquid product, if you prefer, hey, I don't want to mix things. I don't want. I don't have a backpack sprayer. Don't feel like messing with it. I just want something granular. Then go with this guy here. Go with the uh, the granular prodiamine. It's also got seven percent potassium, which is good for this time of year. Uh, this you can apply. Now, again, uh, the the ideal time to apply your pre-emergent would really have been in the month of September, but it's it's uh, it's still better to get some down now than not do anything. You're going to deal with less weeds than uh, than if you if you don't do anything. So yeah. So as far as um, to prevent um, weeds, prodiamine is what I would say to go with. Now, if you're looking to eliminate weeds, uh, what we got we got to go back to. Um, our post-emergent section. And for that, we have a kit that has tenacity, sedge hammer, a marker dye surfactant. This is a kit that, uh, that is designed for cool season lawns, guys like you. Um, or if you wanna go a la carte, you've got tenacity, which is a great broad spectrum herbicide for cool season grass. You've got sedge hammer, which is also safe for cool season grass and is good for your sedges. But again, if you're looking to do all for all of these and save yourself a little bit of money, then the kit is the way that I would go. So you got a couple of different options, uh, one for pre-emergent, another for post-emergent. So you are all set. Again, the weed killer section on the golf course lawn store has everything you need. Again, given that we are in, what are we in, mid-November, we're in the middle of November, um, you, you know, don't expect miracles out of the pre-emergent app. Because again, the, the, the effectiveness of pre-emergent is really in the name prior to the weeds emerging, but it's still better than not doing 
anything at all. Again, you may you may have to look into some post-emergent herbicide like Tenacity um, or try it or something similar if you have weeds creeping in your lawn all uh, already because the pre-emergent is not going to do anything for the weeds that are already showing up. So hope that helps, sir. If you need anything else, let me know. We got another super chat here, one from Mr. Ben Raham. Thank you so much, Ben. Super chat received. He says, I thought I'll turf rake the leaves and compost. Oh, there are too many. I sent you a picture you can share. The leaf rake in the front of the pile is 54 inches wide, and the leaf pile is six, uh, six I guess six feet tall by 18 inches in a horseshoe. Oh, we gotta see this picture. This looks like, uh, this looks pretty, it's gotta look pretty insane. Okay, well, it's, we'll see if that will show up, Ben. It's kind of a small image, but if you guys wanna see what Ben is talking about, so I can scroll in here, and we're scrolling, and we're scrolling, and we're scrolling, and we're scrolling, all right. So he's saying that is six, wow, six feet tall, uh, six feet tall by 18, I guess 18 feet wide. Good grief. In a horseshoe. That's, that's a lot, man. Yeah. So you're going to, you're going to want to, um, yeah, you're going to have to do some way, some other way of getting rid of that, Ben. I don't know if there's services that'll pick it up uh, around here. And again, I'm, I, again, make sure you check your local ordinances, make sure you live in an area that you're allowed to do this. But there, and around here, what, what I've seen is for people that have their own land, don't do this if you live in a subdivision, because I'm pretty sure it's against your HOA. But if people that have their own land, what I've been noticing is that people will rake the leaves up and then create like, um, like, like create a, uh, a, a barrier around it, like dig out, like create a dirt um, barrier between the leaves and the rest of the, of the lawn, and they burn them. That's the way to, that they're disposing of them. But again, you got to make sure that one, you're allowed to do that in the area that you're in. Most HOAs have say something against about against setting fires or having um, you know burning uh, burning debris unless you're you have like a fire pit or somewhere to get to get rid of them. Uh, but yeah, man, that's a that's a lot. That's a lot. I don't know if there's again a service you can use to help pick it up. It might be cost prohibitive to get rid of that many leaves. But if you're able to to burn them or you know that as a way to get dispose of them, um, then that's that's something to uh, an option you might can consider. So like your picture is a good example of where mulching is not that's not going to work. Like you're not going to be able be able to mulch that. You're going to create more problems by mulching that back into your lawn than uh, than it solves as far as getting rid of it. So thanks for seeing the picture, man. I really do appreciate it. And again, because you have now given a higher super chat, you are now. The show sponsor. Let me get you in here, Mr. Ben Raham. Thanks for that, sir. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, Ben. Um, looking at pictures like that, while I get a lot of grief from friends of mine saying, "Oh man, you know your lawn's really bare. There's no like trees or no ornamental, nothing to make it look nice." When I see pictures like that, it makes me realize that I made the right uh, choice on not um, not having a bunch of trees in the lawn. Because while trees, I will admit, they do look nice, especially if you you cut the canopy up nice and tall, and you just have a nice big trunk, and you know they 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 act of like you know decorations for the, for a lawn. This time of year, when fall rolls around, they're just a huge pain in the neck. So. Thanks for uh, sharing the picture, sir. And yeah, I'm not. I outside of having a service pick them up or burn them, I don't. I, I don't have anything for you really, man. On how to get rid of that? That's a lot. It's a lot of material you're dealing with. Appreciate the support. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. All right. Next up, we have Mr. Colin Potter in the house. He says, "Hey, Ron, have a good weekend and happy Thanksgiving." Lawn is now dormant, and we had a dusting of snow today, man. Uh, yeah, I, I'm guessing if you're already getting snow wherever you wherever you live, uh, yeah, that's the, the lawn would definitely have be would definitely would have checked out by this uh, this time of year. So, thanks for the kind words. Yeah, man, Thanksgiving is upon us here soon, isn't it? It's the 18th. So when is it? Is it next week? Yeah, next week is Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, we'll probably still do a show that Friday night, right? Because Thanksgiving's Thursday, and I'm sure you guys, being the demanding bunch you are, are gonna be like, hey, man. We need, our, we need our live stream. So unless you guys vote against it, I, I don't think I'm going out of town or going anywhere. So more than likely, we'll still do the show next week. If that changes, I'll let you know. But that's that's the plan. All right, next up is Tutrilla saying, hey, Ron, and happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday, Tutrilla. Hopefully you're doing well, sir. And his comment is, as of now, my grass is still green. How is your grass still? Where do you live? How is your grass still green this time of year? Uh, if you can sense a little bit of hate in my voice, a little bit of, a little bit of jealousy, it's there. Because when it comes to applying my last fungicide, should I wait until the grass is 70% dormant or just layer down now? I'm in Henry County, Tiff Tough. Man, because you're in Georgia, how is your grass still 70%? Um, your grass is still green. Wow. Um, here's the thing. I, I still, last year, the, 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 long, the short answer is I would do it now. 
Um, last year, when we had a much warmer fall and the grass really didn't go dormant until December, I still did my preventative fungicide in October and in November. So I would still do that. I'm just answering the question as based on what I have done in the past and what I did this year. So, uh, so yeah, I would still put it down uh, to Chilla. With the, the cold weather we've been having here lately, it sh it'll be checking out here fairly soon because you're in Henry County. I think that's your north, north of us. I think you're north, north of um of where I am. So, with that being the case, you're gonna your your lawn's gonna be fully dormant here before you know it. I would get your preventative fungicide down. So, congrats on having so having a green lawn. And uh, yeah, let me know if you need anything else. Our NMS auditor is here. He says, Ron, the hat arrived earlier this week. We'll send pictures with the Greens Master 3250 when it arrives. Thanks. Awesome, man. So yeah, so uh, NMS Auditor, if you guys don't know, last week, last week we had the hat giveaway. He was the winner. And then also some stickers that we gave away as well too, the golf course lawn store stickers. Like if you order, um, you know, uh, Pri Primo or a Celeprint like here recently, you have also gotten one of these stickers, but we also sent some of these out to some lucky, it's way too, not focusing, um, to some, uh, to two winners last, last week as well. So I'm glad that you got the hat. Hopefully the other people that won the stickers also got them too. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. I gotta do that more often, man. I, the give, giveaways are actually fun. I, I forgot how much fun they are to do. If anything, just to hear all the belly aching. That if, if for nothing else, that's what makes it worth doing. So yeah, I'll look out for that picture when you get the new equipment. And uh, I'm glad you got the hat, sir. Enjoy it, wear it in good health. And then <laughs> Alex, Alex Lee's like, it's time, Bruce Buffer. That's right, man. That's right. It's like a UFC fight about to kick off, right? All right. Uh, next up, we have Doug 350Z Twin Turbo saying, Happy Friday, Ron. Where's LG? We need to update up. Here's the thing. I'm sure LG knows. I'm sure he knows. I'm sure he knows. He just doesn't want to deal with all the abuse. And uh, knowing how you guys are and how, how you're, you're probably going to come down on him, he's probably just, you know, let's lay low for a little while lay low for a little while and then he'll just kind of mosey back into the live stream and just act like nothing else happened. Knowing him will be like, oh, there was a giveaway? I t man, I forgot, I totally forgot about that. Well, whoever won, congrats. You know, I just, I wasn't really tied to it. That's how, you know, how LG, uh, how LG is. All right, guys, definitely get to keep the questions rolling in, comments rolling in. All right, next up, we have C. Hill saying, let's go, greetings and salutations, Ron. Thanks again for all you do. Iron sharpens iron, that is true. So true, sir. I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys showing up and hanging out, being my end of the week therapy, my decompression, just talking about uh, lawn care, you know, a topic near and dear to my heart. All right, next up is Golf Castle. He says, hey, Ron, would you be worried about cold temperatures, say 27 degrees, and this damaging my ultra dwarf Bermuda green, my ultra dwarf Bermuda uh, backyard green? At what point, at what temp would you put a cover on it? Just a lot of work I like to protect. Mm. So here's the thing, Golf Castle. I wish Demir were around to be able to um, to chime in on this one because I don't. I'm not familiar with uh, Ultra Dwarf, Dwarf as far as its uh, its tolerance. 27 should be so would still be fine, I would think. I mean, as far as it, I, I imagine it might start losing its color. But I, you know, when you got if you get, when you get lower, I think you'd have to go lower than that to start looking at um, uh, situations where it's going to get damaged, like lower than like into the teens for prolonged periods of time is when I expect to see some damage. Like when I was uh, listening to Demir, I believe he said that they got snow, they got a, a couple um, a couple snow events, and that's when they, you know, when that cleared away is when they, they covered up the greens. We're not anywhere near that. And, um, you know, so if, if you get 27 now and then, I don't believe it would be a problem. Again, I don't have, I don't particularly have um, ultra dwarfs. I, mean, I can't say for sure how cold tolerant it is, but most Bermuda, you know, if it's dipping into the, to the, to the high 20s, um, just in the evening, in the day, it warms back up into the the, the 40s. Like it's tend, it tends to be happening around um, where I am now. Um, it should tolerate that just fine. Uh, so yeah, I'll do some. That's a good point. It's a good question. Let me do some research on that and get back to you as far as a talking point for um, for next week. Or if you want, I will also reach out to Demir and get his thoughts on it. I don't know if he. Ha I'm almost positive they don't have um, Ultra Dwarf on their greens. So he's, he, he'll be like, I don't know. He'll be like, check, he'll do like, check, check whatever the, uh, the manufacturer, check what, uh, whatever Google says is probably what he's going to tell me. But, um, but yeah, I'll look into it and, and see if I can get an answer for you. If you're on next week, I will, uh, you, we'll, we'll answer it then. Or if you want an answer sooner than that, you can send me an email here at ron at golfcourselon.com. Send me an email. And once I get an answer, I'll, I'll hit you back and say, Hey, this is what, what I found out. So 
if it's just dipping into the 20s, into the high 20s and coming and warming up during the rest of the day, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be too, too concerned. All right. Uh, next up is Mr. Jim. Jim, I'm I'm Gavri Gavrilos. I think we got here. He says, so Jim's up next. He has a question. He says, uh, Northern Illinois, turf type, tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass. What's a good soil amendment that can be put down with a spreader? So it depends on what you're trying to achieve, uh, Jim. Um, a Probably my favorite soil amendment that is um, something you can literally put down year round as long as the ground isn't frozen. Now you're in Northern Illinois, so I'm sure you guys are gonna get snow at some point if, you are, if it doesn't already have snow already. But what I'll show you is a product called Essential G. It's granular, super easy to apply. Again, you go to the golf course lawn store, go to shop, and then Miramichi Green Biostimulants. This is, is literally my one of my favorite things to apply to the lawn. Literally, my lawn has gotten it every month since the summer of 2020. And uh, it's it's a great product. It's um, It's got biochar, compost, um, some co reclaimed coffee grounds in it, a bit of humate, a bit of silicon. It's, it's all good stuff that is gonna help improve the quality of your soil. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to really soil test before you apply this. So and it's something you can literally apply year round. You can't apply, apply too much of it. So as far as like it damaging your lawn or going too heavy, really, it's really based on your budget. Um, I haven't come across anyone that, that really was able to buy enough of it to really um, cause any kind of a, any kind of a negative, um, negative impact. But, uh, but that would be my thing, this, especially this time of year is, is essential G. If your lawn is still growing, right? If your lawn is still actively growing and you're still mowing it, so you're still out there at least once a week still mowing it, continue to feed it. You know what I mean? It's still, if, if, if grass, if your grass is still actively growing, you're still out there mowing it, you know, whatever fertilizer is that you've been using on your lawn, you can continue to do that. But as far as a soil amendment, um, I am a huge fan of essential G. In addition, so like next year, right? When springtime rolls around, something you can look at is our carbon kit. So this contains release zero, which is a liquid biosimilant, liquid um, micronized carbon. There's a kelp product in NutriKelp. And then finally biospectrum, which is a, um, a it's microbial food. It helps inc increase the microbial activity in your soil. These three are available in a kit here as well. So uh, if your grass is still actively growing, like you're still out there doing stuff in the lawn, you can definitely get the, the carbon kit and apply it, that's a good option too. But I really only reserve that for um, for when the lawn is actively still growing. Like I don't I don't use it um, you know when once the once the lawn checks out. So this is an option. You have two different versions of it. You have a release you have a version that just has um, release zero which has no nitrogen in it, no um no 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 nitrogen at all. And then you have a version that has 901C which is a nitrogen and potassium product that we all that we also make as well. So there's two different versions of the kit. There's one that has no nitrogen, um, or really the only nitrogen is just in NutriCal, but release zero is 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 devoid of any kind of nitrogen. So if you so that would be an option if you are so you have some your liquid fertilizer of, cho fertilizer of choice that you already want to use, then use mixing that with this version would be fine. If you don't have a liquid fertilizer that you like that you of choice that you want to um, that you want to use, then 901C is the one that I would go with. It's only like five dollars more. You get some you get nine percent nitrogen, a little bit of um, potassium in it, as well as what's in NutriKelp. So it just depends on which way you want to go. From a liquid standpoint, the carbon kit. From a granular standpoint, that can be put down to your, to answer your question that can come with the spreader. Uh, Essential G is what I would uh, would use. So. Hope that helps, sir. And it's that can be used on all types of grass. It doesn't really, I mean, you've got a turf type tall fescue in, in, in Kentucky bluegrass, but it's good for all grass types, all grass types. So it's, it's, uh, is what you can use that on. Great question, great question. If you need anything else, definitely let me know. And guys, I gotta tell you, it's a little sidebar. I gotta, I gotta brag on myself a little bit. I remember when I used to have a really hard time saying turf type tall fescue, and now I could just rolls off the tongue. Just rolls off the tongue. Before, it was a problem. There was a challenge, you know? It, it, was, it used to tie me up, but now, I've gotten to the point where I can say that now, turf type tall fescue without issue. Makes me happy. All right, next up is Mr. Robert Majoros. He says, just saying, I walked the lawn today and I may have to do a cleanup mow with the big deer. I think you do. You know, I haven't even seen the lawn, Robert, but you know, just, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling it. And I, uh, I, I think a cleanup cut before the lawn fully checks out and goes dormant is in order. Plus you want to give the deer you know, you got you got to get the big dog eat, right? If it wants to, it's probably in the garage just saying, "Man, I'm just, just sitting here." And I, March is a long time to get fired up. You can, you know, you can put it on the lawn one one last time and then put it away for the rest of the season. So no, no harm, no harm in doing that. All right, 
Next up is uh, Doug through 50 Z. He says, uh, he says, Ron, does a solid work on the annoying white flies? I could not get rid of them for the life of me last year. Mm, I don't believe so. It's not rated for that. But what will kill the white flies, if I've got it here nearby, is the Miramichi Green Pest Control. This guy is awesome on that. So literally, you can put this in. I like to use it in a fogger, and I'll show you. I'll show you where it is on the store here. Let me go over here real quick. All right, so we go to Miramichi Green, and I think I've got the pest control right here. Yep. So uh, I've got a video here showing how I use it. I use it with a fogger. I like that because it's easier to spray on shrubs, on lawn patio furniture, on, you know, it's, it's just, it goes further that way. You can absolutely still use this with a backpack sprayer. And you can also do the same thing. You can spray it on patio furniture, on your back patio, on plants, on, and, and as far as being, uh, as far as white flies, very, very good product, excellent product. Um, what I would, what I would do is every three weeks, Say you're having it, if, if they're eating any of your shrubs or anything like that, every three weeks, get out there and, and spray this, and this should do a really good job as far as keeping keeping white flies away. It works really well, well against that. In addition, uh, for mosquitoes, ants, ticks, noceums, roaches, aphids, um, I mean, chinch bugs, it covers a lot of different, a lot of different um, insects, targets a lot of them, and it smells good, non-toxic, so it's literally, as, right after you're done spraying it, kids and or fur babies can re-enter the area. So this is what I would uh, I would be using to target white flies. A celeprin, I, I don't believe it's um it's labeled for that. It's it's more it's more for insects um that are in in the soil. Yeah. So I've, I've never I don't I can check the label, but I'm almost positive white flies are not on the label for a celeprin. But the pet Miramichi Green Pest Control, uh, that will be your jam for getting rid of white flies and mosquitoes and you know a bunch of other annoying bugs that make being outdoors less fun. And it's non-toxic, which is also good. All right, Higgy pops up next. He says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. What's going on, Higgy? Thanks for coming to hang out, sir. Appreciate you as as always. Thanks for coming and taking some time out of your Friday evening to come hang out with us here in the live stream. And then next up is Colin Potter. He's back. He says, headway G application rate per thousand square feet for preventative winter apps versus targeting something in particular. I want to say the rate that I, I recommend is, I think it's like 2.1, um, let me t let me think, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Yes, because it's like 2.1 pounds per thousand, is, I believe is the rate that I, I list for headway. So, Colin, um, the answer is in this video. So if we go to, again, the store, fungicide, insecticide, and headway, um, this video covers, it has a bunch of different application rates um, the rate that I used and um, spreader and spreader settings. Um, but if memory serves me, uh, 2.1 pounds per thousand square feet is what um, I'm pretty sure is what I use as a catch-all rate that uh, that will um, that will work well. I'm almost positive it is because I know that in that video I said something. I, I spoke along the lines that it covers. Um, uh, right around 15,000 square feet, and it's a 30 pound bag, so around two pounds is right. Yeah, so two pounds, two pounds per thousand is what I would use, and that's the rate that I use for preventative too. I use the same rate. I use the uh, I use the same rate whenever I did my app here in October and again in November. So I use the same two pound uh, rate, or I think it's a spreader setting of I think memory shows me of 11, 11 and a half on an Earthway. That will do my entire lawn with a little, with a little bit, just a little skosh, a little bit left over. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the rate that I use. Um, again, if you're targeting something in particular, so the the label which we have on the store as well is going to have different application rates uh, for if you're targeting different types of lawn diseases. But um, that two that two pound rate is is a pretty good catch all rate uh, for for pretty for 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 most things that Headway is labeled to. Uh, to target. So hope that helps. Again, 15, you, you can, you can go lighter, but that rate is a, is a good rate. It's what I used, um, when I had, um, a large patch in the lawn last year and last spring in August, not this year, but last year in, um, in, in, uh, sorry, August in April. And then, um, that's the rate that I used this spring and also the same rate that I used this fall. So that, that two pound rate was very effective of take, as far as arresting the spread of large patch in my lawn. And again, as a preventative, it, it worked really well too. So hope that helps, sir. If you need anything else, let me know. That video in the description of the, um, of the product will, will walk you through all that. 
and um, it's it's a great product as far as fungicides go. As far as a straight fungicide goes for residential lawns, it's a it's a really good one. You got azoxystrobin and propiconazole in there, so you are good to go. Papa Mo's Low is up next. He says, I need to purchase the Verticut cartridge for the Sterling. I agree. I agree. I think you should. He says, when do you recommend to start verticutting in the spring? Uh, okay, so it depends. If you are, it depends on, what, on how you're starting out the, the season, Papa Mo's Low. If you are thinning out the lawn to start the season, meaning you're doing a, a, a heavy scalp, an aggressive scalp, then I would say you can get by until the end of May to do your, verse, your first verticut. You know, really once the lawn begins to thicken up is when you want to start getting out there and verticutting it. So really once, because you're going to have it when you, since you have the sterling, once a month is a good, is a good um, cadence for your, for your verticutting. Again, it's going to allow you to go lighter, not get too aggressive. And then as far as the turf raking, you can do that as often as you want. You can do it every time before you mow if you wanted to, just means you're gonna be spending twice the amount of time out there because you gotta pass over it with the turf rake and then pass over it when you mow. But as far as verticutting, um, if you are scalping in the spring, I would wait until May, the end of May, to do your first your first verticut and then do May, June, July, I'll just do, you'd probably get realistically four in, you know, at least three, maybe four verticuts in throughout the growing season. Um, and you'll be able to tell. I mean, you know, if, if in July it's growing really aggressively, you might, you might do it um, every three weeks. You know, maybe starting in June, you start going every three weeks if it's growing really aggressively and thickening up a lot. Um, I found that once a month is, is plenty. It's a good balance between not beating up the turf too much so it still looks nice while preventing a lot of the cutting issues that you can run into if you allow the lawn to get too thick. So I would get the cartridge and, um, and just plan for the end of May to start your verticutting, assuming that you know, temperatures are how they, how they've been traditionally been. So hope that, hope that helps. And if you're going to get a, a cartridge, get it now, man. Cause you, who knows with the way the price of everything is going up, um, and it's getting more and more difficult to get stuff. So if you want one, if you know that verticutting is something you're going to do, I would lean towards getting a cartridge sooner than, than later. I really wouldn't wait too long in the season to go about, to go about doing that. All right, great question. All right, next up is Tug, Doug 350Z says, thank you, Ron. If it goes bad, I will be silent. No, you won't. No, you won't. You're not going to be silent. Let, uh, let's let see. You know, it's, it is, it, you are not going to be silent if it if it goes bad. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm sure LG's here. He's probably just lurking. Let me see. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure sure he's here. All right, next up is G Free. He says, uh, hey, Ron, and hashtag Stripe Action Gang, cool Friday. Because I could have bought the big outlet for what I paid for tree removal. The leaves are all free from the neighbors. Fun, yeah. You know, that's one thing that I didn't I didn't realize. So I, a buddy of mine, you guys remember last year when I went and helped a friend top dress his uh, his lawn? Do you guys remember? It was like a, it was this early Saturday morning. I was out there doing like YouTube stories showing it, and he, he was telling me that that some like to to remove the average to remove a tree is like between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars per tree. And I was like, that's I mean, but granted, these are full grown, really big trees. And given, you know, seeing what they do as far as like all the, like one of the danger of it, but also um, the amount of work that goes into doing that, I get it. But it's uh, like really be, really think about if you want to have really huge trees in your lawn, man, because if you have to get rid of them, it is not cheap to do. Not cheap at all. Okay, Ben Zeppi says, I did mulch them with the rider last year with no ill effect in the lawn. If you don't mind, dust clouds in, in uh, <laughs> indescribable uh, proportions. Nice, very, very cool. Yeah, so there's different, so you, see, you hear different um, thoughts on that. Um, some people say, you know, you can mulch, like literally everything that falls off the trees, feel free to mulch it, throw it right back into the lawn, it's free food. But there is, I think there is a balance to that. I think that, you know, if you, if you have a, um, I know, I know, I say a reasonable amount, right? Reasonable, how do you really quantify reasonable, right? A reasonable amount of leaves that are hitting your lawn and you're able to mulch them in one or two mowing sessions, that's not too bad. But if it's taught, if you if you have a situation like yours where it's not just stuff coming or debris coming from the trees that you used to have, but also that's coming from, that keeps coming from lawns around you, I don't know, man. I mean, I think that, you know, having all that breakdown over the winter when it's not really that hot, is is um is probably not going to happen. I think you just you could be potentially creating thatch problems for yourself next year. So I you know if you're going to do that, I would say a um you know you know mulching it back in the lawn in moderation is good. It's almost like like grass clippings, right? Like if you have if you're um if you allow your your grass to get you know 
three, you know, three, four inches tall, Bermuda get three, four inches tall, and you cut it every couple of weeks, like mulching that back into the lawn is gonna cause more problems than, than it solves. You really don't wanna do that, right? So leaves, while they do break down, if you are if you get too much of it, especially given the cooler temps that you have this time of year, I, I just think that you're setting yourself up for, um, you know, for, for a thatch buildup issue in uh, come springtime. All right, next up is Rob's Blazer. He says, hey everyone, sorry I'm late. Well, Rob, we're glad you're here because everyone was, we were holding up the train. We're about to shut the show down and you showed up now. So we will now uh, continue. Appreciate you coming to hang out. You know, I'm just giving you a hard time, right? Don't, don't take me seriously. All right, Ben says, as usual, thanks for hosting, Ron. The rest of y'all, thanks for being here. Hit that like button, it's free. That is true, guys. We've got, you know, 50 of us here in the live stream tonight, which I appreciate given this time of year and no one's really caring about their grass and you guys are still showing up. So if you guys wouldn't mind hitting that like button, I would really appreciate it. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a great, and to Ben's point, free way to support the channel. All right. Ben has a further comment where he says, the great thing about the liquid carbon kit is mixing bi-weekly with split PGR treatments, actual use uh, of both confirming outstanding results, y'all. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. I, I forgot to mention that. The one thing that is also great about this is that uh, I've tested mixing it with like all the liquid fertilizer products that we sell at the golf course lawn store. I've tested it with them and there's been no, uh, no ill effects. So to Ben's point, uh, the carbon kit, I have tested mixing this along with, so the, the three of them, Release Zero, Nutri-Kelp, 901, um, I'm sorry, Release Zero, uh, Nutri-Kelp, and Biospectrum, or 901C, Nutri-Kelp, and Biospectrum. I've tested mixing those, uh, just applying them obviously just by themselves. I've mixed them with Turfplex and applied them, no issue, mixed with Primo Max you know, the PGR we all know and love in, in the same way he's talking about in uh, every two week split apps and bi-weekly applications. And it mixes nicely with all of them. The one thing you'll find guys, you know, you ever look at some kelp products where you um, you pour them out and there's like, um, I don't want to say debris, but there's like uh, I don't know, little chunks and, and stuff floating around in it. Like they didn't really, um, they didn't really like break it down or, or, um, or, um, or filter it or strain it with Nutri Kelp, you're not going to get that. It's going to be very, it's going to be very, very fine. It's very concentrated, and like all the products, the the Nutri Kelp, the 901C or Release Zero, um, and the Biospectrum, they all mix really well. I've never had an issue with any any clogging. So this is like the spray tip that I use, the um, the T Jet, the 110 degree one. This produces a very fine droplet, and I've never experienced any issues with clogging using the carbon kit along with uh, with Primo or any other fertilizer or um, or micronutrient that I mix in the tank along with it. It's a really good product from someone that likes to mix and match uh, lots of uh, as far as build your, your own personal concoction that you're putting on the lawn. So it was really I'm really really happy about that compared to some things that you find in other biosimilants from other manufacturers. So it's a great it's a great um, option if you are, if you're someone that likes to, to mix things. All right. All right. Next up we have whiskey, whiskey blood. He says for fertilizers at a basic level, at a basic level, what week in increments in weeks would you recommend applications? Five step program, cools in turf Midwest. Okay. So the most correct answer to your question, like like most things in life, whiskey, is it depends. It depends on which fertilizer you're using, um, and it depends on what your goals are. I'll show you here. So on the Golf Course Lawn Store, we have a blog, and in there, one of them that we have is has a calendar that answers this very question. So we'll go back to the store, and if you go to the blog section, which I got to tell you, I'm pretty proud of. We've been adding stuff um, to it here, a couple articles a month. There's a cool article we just added on, is artificial grass bad for the environment? You gotta check that out, guys. It's an interesting read, really short. Um, you know, what's your lawn care guy? But to answer the question that you're after, you're gonna go down and go to page two. It's the very first blog that I wrote for the, um, for the store. Actually, I actually wrote this before I even had the store. And it's a step-by-step -step guide for getting a golf course lawn. At the bottom of this blog, and I'll put it in the chat for you because I realize, I'm sure you don't want to have to go and dig all this up at Whiskey Blood. So it's here at Whiskey. There, right there. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of this, right? I mean, and you should read it because this is really good. Um, but at the very bottom, there is a calendar that talks about what exactly what you're you're um, you're referring to or what you want. This will work for both cool season grass and warm season grass. So it starts out by getting a soil test because the soil test is going to tell us what kind of fertilizer 
you that you're that, that, that is a good fit for your particular soil. And then based on that, we got um, putting out a fertilizer, doing your insecticide, and then every month, right? It talks about applying. So in this case, this this calendar is written for uh, Humic Max, which is a fertilizer that we're hoping to get back in stock next year. But if you're using, say, something like um, Flagship, like this fertilizer here, I'll show you, which is like a also a quick release fertilizer. So you go to Lawnfert and this guy here, right? The flagship, which is 2406. This is also a quick release um, fertilizer. So that option, that you could literally take Humic Max and substitute it for that, or substitute that for Humic Max. And this would be your, your, um, your application calendar. So every month you would do, apply it at three pounds per thousand. Uh, and that rate, that's a good feeding rate for throughout the growing season. So one bag at that three pound per thousand rate is gonna cover 15,000 square feet. So depending on the size of your lawn, say you've got, I'm gonna just make my life easier here. Say you have a 5,000 square foot lawn, that one bag, that one bag of um, flagship is gonna cover you for three months, right? But, uh, but that three pound per, per thousand rate, um, I like because if it allows you, it allow, it produce, puts on enough nitrogen to, pr to provide good feeding, but also leaves you a little bit of headroom that if you want to spray like a micronutrient or biostimulant, um, you know, to kind of, Keep, keep the color consistent and not cause too much ex excess growth, you still have some headroom to be able to do that. Also, if you're gonna use something like this, like growth regulator, there's still headroom for mixing some fertilizer in with this um, when you're putting that down on your lawn. Again, I've got blog posts all about that. There's videos on it, but that calendar that I just linked for you in the chat, in the show chat, um, you scroll to the bottom of that post and in there you will, it's gonna, it's gonna have everything that you need. So it really, it depends on what kind of fertilizer you're using. So like, let's say you went to, you're going like to Home Depot or something, right? And you're buying like one of the Scott's extended feeding fertilizers, then this program will not work. You don't wanna, you wanna do that, use that fertilizer every month because it's designed to release over a much longer period of time. So the type of fertilizer that you choose makes a difference as far as how often you apply it. So the, what I, the link that I gave you um, is to, is assumes that you're applying monthly at a low rate. That's gonna produce really good results as far as consistency and growth and color. And that's what I teach in um, in the Golf Course Lawn Academy, That's which is our, our paid course that is um, also available on the store as well. So hope that helps. It, the, 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 that program works for both cool season and warm season grass. And again, in addition to fertilizing, it also covers, that calendar covers your um, Grow your insecticide and also your fungicide applications as well. So hope that helps, sir. If you need anything else, definitely let me know. Great question. I'm glad I like where you're thinking. I like, I like where your mind's going. One the only thing question you didn't ask, and something that I would I would suggest doing as well, it's a good time, good thing to do this time of year as well, is to get a soil test done. Uh, these are relatively inexpensive. They're like $30. If you get it, if you get the, the kit that comes with this and the probe tool, it's like 55, I think, 59, something like that. But you only have to buy this once. And as far as knowing what is the correct fertilizer for your particular grass type that's correct for your lawn, this is going to tell you. You know, getting you know getting a soil test is going to tell you exactly what type of fertilizer is the best one that's going to be the best fit for your lawn. That's you didn't ask that, but if you're going to go through all the trouble of really, you know, transforming your lawn, trying to create the lawn that's going to dominate the neighborhood, a soil test is a great tool for ensuring that you get the best results possible. You get the best um, for your investment. Great question, great, great question. All right, so we got some super chats here that I need to go and take care of. Let me roll down here a little bit. Okay, we got the notorious LG, he's in the house. I knew it, I knew it, guys, I could feel it. I could, feel, you know you can feel the disturbance in the force? I knew it, I knew he was here. All right, first we got a super chat from Mr. Doug, 350Z Twin Turbo. Thank you so much for that, Doug. Super chat he says, Ron, with Primo Max, should you apply if two days after mowing or two days prior. Um, so I would, let me think about this. I typically apply Primo right after I mow. So if I mowed, like say today, I would, I would either apply Primo a couple hours, like later on in the afternoon, or I'd apply it the next day. What I would not do is apply Primo and then like the next day go mow grass. I, what I would do is I would apply it and then give it two days and then um, and then do your, your next mowing. So either mow and then apply, like say you mow in the morning and then apply at some point that time today and then don't mow again for a couple of days. Or um, yeah, that, and that's that's what I normally do. Normally I don't, It's it, this, the rule for herbicides doesn't really apply for Primo because it, it's rain fast in really 
a couple of hours. And it, it the, its uptake is also relatively quick too, but I would give it a couple of days. So I would mow, apply Primo, and then whenever you, the next time you're slated to mow, for most of you, it's gonna be at least two to three days. Then you're gonna be, you'll be good to go. The, 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 the products will be taken up, Trexpac ethyl will be absorbed into the plant and you'll, um, you're, you're gonna get all the benefits for three to four weeks uh, going that route. So mow, Primo, and then wait and then mow again. Great, great question. I appreciate you. All right, so we have another super chat, one from Mr. LG. Of course, he's here. Super chat received. He says, a little late here, but got my first super chat, got rejected for unknown reasons. What I missed last week? Oh man, you forgot last week, you, you dude, last week we did the giveaway of the hat. I know you're, I mean, I know you don't really like winning stuff. So, and you're probably busy doing, you know, other stuff. I don't know, like sharpening your mower or doing doing something else fun. But uh, but yeah, last week we did the giveaway of the uh, the hat. Um, you know, NMS Auditor won it. And, you know, everyone was really bummed that you weren't here because they, you know, they were all pulling for you. They're really hoping that you would be the one uh, to win. And uh, yeah, you just weren't, you weren't here. So we don't, we don't know what to do. Next time we're going to send out like a search party and to make sure that you know when we're doing giveaways to, to be present because, um, you know, you're such a, you're an example of how to win right. And also in the rare event when you don't win, how to also be a great example of how to, to lose with, with, with grace and dignity. So next time we're going to make sure we, uh, we in you include you um, when we are doing uh, giveaways, LG. I'm not sure what happened, man. Normally you're, you're here for these, but, uh, but yeah, that's what happened last, last week. Nothing, nothing too major, nothing too major. All right. Next up is Mr. Whiskey Blood. Okay. So Whiskey, I answered your question. Um, let me know if you need anything else. You should be good to go as far as that. And yet a follow-up where he says, appreciate the format. Got another question for you, Captain. In theory, dethatching before overseeding makes sense to get good seed to soil contact. Agree with that. Is minimal op is minimal optimal for any benefit? So here's what I would say. Um de here's the thing: dethatching, turf raking. Uh, they are terms that get thrown all around a lot interchangeably. Here's what I would say. Thinning out the lawn, to your point, thinning out the lawn prior to putting down seed is a good idea. It, it, it opens up the canopy, allows more heat, more sunlight to get down to the soil. It does improve seed to soil contact, which is gonna improve your germination rates. What I would say is you don't, as when I think of dethatching, I think of a very aggressive, you know, getting, getting down in the soil, tearing out, um, tearing out thatch, tearing out a lot of debris. And I don't think that is really necessary to prepare for a seeding. So, um, you know, a, a, a good turf raking, you know, again, just to thin out the lawn a little bit or a light dethatching, also a good, a good um, you know, pr a preparation step for your, your seeding project. But as far as going like, super crazy aggressive, I don't particularly think it's necessary to get a, a good result. But yeah, to your point, anything you can do to improve soy to seal seed contact, you think about it. I mean, if you have, um, you have cool season grass, I remember from your, from your earlier question, let's say your lawn is like a three inch lawn, three inches tall, right? If it's three inches tall and it's really thick, that's difficult for sunlight, for sunlight and also by extension heat to get down to the so to get down to the soil and really help with germination. So if you're gonna thin the lawn, if you you know turf rake it and you thin the lawn out a little bit, dethatch it lightly to take a lot, get a lot of debris out, um, it's gonna thin out the lawn. It's gonna improve the amount or increase the amount of sunlight and heat that's able to get into uh, down to the soil. So it's gonna it's gonna improve your um, your seeding results. So yes, there is there there are benefits to doing it. I would do it. I would just not go super aggressive because you really don't have to do that to get a good result. So great question. That's a good one. So when you plan your your overseed whiskey or your seeding project whiskey blood, I guess I'm guessing uh, spring of next year because we're pretty pretty late in the season to be doing a seeding project. Um, so hopefully, uh, I'm thinking you're probably thinking like next uh, next year it would be the plan. All right, next up is Mr. Ben Raham. He says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Said Warren Buffett, said a very, said a very, very wise man. He said, if you get past the upfront sticker shock and look at the, the use rates and the results, uh, the prosumer products Ron is making available do work better. That is true. I mean, if you look at, uh, again, if you look at like say a bag of, um, like we'll use flagship as an example, right? So a, a bag of that is like $67, $68 shipped to your door, I think. I have to look at the price of it, but something like that. It's, it's under $70, but you get three months of application. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very good, high quality fertilizer. 
And, you know, it's, you think about it, if you take, you know, that same that amount of money and you spread it over three months, it's really not that bad. When it comes to the liquids, like what you get out of the Miramichi Green biostimulants, I mean, it's, you got to realize, it was, it was Miramichi Green, like we are not their prime target, like their prime demographic, like they are used by golf courses, by the professional turf industry, like far, far more than DIY. It was really when I got, um, you know, I, I made contact with them and I said, hey, listen, you know, I, I, you know, I know you guys are really, y'all are big and you guys, you know, do a lot with um, um, like equestrian and, and golf courses and that type of stuff. But I'll tell you, us DIY people, we can appreciate the good stuff. You know, we, we, if you, if you give us, you give us some, you know, give a good product, we can appreciate that. And um, they took a chance on me and by making it available to, to you guys, I've, I've not gotten any negative, any negative feedback on either Humic Max, which we don't have in stock right now, or any of the Miramichi Green Biosimilars. I mean, they're, it's, they're really, really good products. Both the granular and liquids, um, they are good. You really, you really do get what you pay for with, um, with those products. And if you look at the, uh, to, to Ben's point, if you look at the application rates, like many of these, the application rates for these guys is like uh, two ounces per thousand. Like you look at the, the the application rates for release zero, it's anywhere between two to seven fluid ounces per thousand square feet with a gallon of water, right? Um, and the rate that I use is, is on the lower end of that. Like I've tested going really heavy. I've tested at like the seven ounce rate. I've tested at like the two to three ounce rate and you get you get comparable results. So, so as far as you may look at the price of it and say it's, it's an expensive product, but it goes a long way. And to, to Ben's point, it's, a, it's, an, it's excellent. I mean, I, I've, uh, I've, was very, I've been very, very happy with how they've, um, how they've been received. It's the same stuff I use on my lawn and it's, um, it's a great product. They make, they make good stuff. You definitely do, definitely do get what you pay for. All right. Next up is Mr. DH designs or Mr. or Mrs. DH designs and painting saying we need rain in Stone Mountain, Georgia. You didn't get any, we had a, we had a bunch here last week. We had a, like three days of just nothing but I think, I think Tuesday we had rain, and um, last week there was a stretch that we had like three days of rain. So we we getting some, at least in my area. It says, it says, we need rain in Stone Mountain, Georgia, and after I cut my winter rye last week, it is taking a long time to grow back. My grass would have grown back by now. Yeah, so, um, I mean, how aggressively did you go on on cutting? Remember, you, you know, a little bit, just taking taking just a taste off a little bit is um, is the way to go. If, um, if you're not getting a lot of rainfall, you're not going to be stressing the grass out as much, and it's going to allow you to maintain the color uh, between between mowings. But I'm surprised because we've, we've had some rain here in Georgia lately. We've had rain in Georgia here lately, so I don't, I'm not sure why in Stone Mountain you guys, uh, you guys didn't get any. You got to send pictures, man. I want to see your winter rye. You know, we got, you know, here, here's the Here's the, the 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 current hotness of the evening as far as pictures. If you guys want to send something in and try and knock him off, this is what Doug sent in. Like this overseeded Bermuda, that is clean right there, guys. I mean, look at that. I mean, I, that's I mean, compare. Here's what you look at too, right? Is are there ryegrass lawns that are deeper green, and then you could say, oh, you know, my some of you coolers and guys will be saying, oh, my lawn looks better than that. But what you have to look at is look in the background. Look at look in the background. You see all the lawns around there that are all checked out, they're all dormant. Like literally his lawn is making the neighbors green, pun intended, with envy, right? Looks pretty awesome. All right, LG is requesting Tango Bolero. I could do that for you, LG, while I get some, um, while I get, take a sip of my water and ask you guys for a like. If you guys wouldn't mind, I mean, it didn't cost you guys anything, hit that like button, free way to support the channel and allows me to have some time to sip my, uh, my agua. Very, very nice, very nice music. All right, next up is Heartfelt Fashion. Grader's in the house, what's going on? It says, Ron, it's been a while. Been busy for weeks on Friday, I'm back now. Glad to hear that, man. I know you are. You guys are taking over the um, the fashion show um, scene. You guys are, are busy doing your thing. So I do appreciate you coming to hang out in the live stream a bit, you know? So it's, I'm glad that even though you have a, um, even though you have a, you know, choices of what you could be doing, when you are free on a Friday night, you choose to spend some of your time here, which is very much appreciated. All right, Ben Reham says, and it costs less per unit than the cheaper stuff. Thanks for the effort, Ron, on making pro products available. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge because especially with the price, how everything is going up, like, you know, trying to balance the, the increase of cost of goods and shipping um, with, you know, 
keeping stuff at a price that you got that you know that that people will actually buy it is always something that's uh, that's a challenge. So I appreciate every single order I get, all the support that we get. Really do appreciate it. All right, Hope uh, Fashion is back. He says, "I surely got a golf course lawn thanks to Ron." Well, I mean, is it really? It's thanks somewhat. I mean, I, I I may have given you some tips around what to do, but you did the work, right? Like, there's a lot of people that that will watch the videos or um, read the blog posts, but they don't actually do anything. So you have to you have to read and study, and then you have to apply. So reading and applying, I, I, in that case, yes, I agree that the program does work, but it's you know a lot of it is your is a lot of your uh, your hard work is what's gotten you where you are. So keep going, man. You know, the thing is, the, the better, the, every lawn is different. And the more you get in tune to with what your particular lawn likes, um, you know, every year it gets better and better. Like, the, like every year I find it takes, um, it's less effort to get the result that I want out of out of the lawn. So I just learn more and more. Like, I mean, even between the uh, the back lawn and front lawn, there's differences that they, um, there's differences between them. I mean, if you look at the, the back, the front lawn, even though they're, they get the exact same nutrient program, the front lawn uh, checked out sooner than uh than the or began to check out sooner than the back lawn and it got the whole leopard stripe thing going on and the front lawn uh, and sorry the back lawn didn't get any of that so it's it's um it's interesting you know in it's it's fun because as you learn more the easier it gets to to you know to dominate to be the be the person that dominates the lawn on your street so unless you happen to be me where i have alex next door and you know you got someone that's always you know, he keeps me on my toes man it keeps me sharp you know there's, there's always there's always a few weeks out of the year where he has my number. There's always a few weeks out of the year where he uh, where he has me. So, so there we go. And um, let's see here. So we have, I got another picture here from Mr. LG. Let me see if I can I can bring that up for you guys. Let me see here if I got another one. Um, and he does like to, to to point out that this is hashtag no filter of of his lawn. So I guess people like doctor up their their lawn pictures. I guess I guess that's a thing, whatever. Um, but yeah, it looks clean, man. It looks clean. I see you're mowing in multiple directions. I like that. You got like the the, the straight mowing, and then you got some diagonal stripe action going on. It looks clean, man. That, that that green is dark. It's dark green. Looking good, man. And you can you can look and see like LG's plot. He is that guy compared to the lawns around. You can see the other lawns are just covered in leaves. But his little plot of planet Earth is looking sharp. He's uh he's laying it down. He's setting the standard. Very very nice work, sir. Very nice work. Keep it uh, keep up the keep up the great work. All right. Next up is Scott R. He says, "Happy Friday." Experimented with a late nitrogen app this year. Granular mid September, uh, mild spray in October, and it took and it took forties and twenties to finally put it to sleep this week. It, I was the last green yard on the block. Nice. So I wouldn't consider that too late, Scott. Not for my, by my books. I mean, you can still do a full a full app in September, assuming your lawn is still growing. And then October, I, that is my last, typically my last application of the season. So you know, if you told me you, was, you were putting down nitrogen in November, I'd be like, mm, I might raise an eye at that. But September, October, that, that should be just fine. Uh, the thing for me that really hurt this year is that we didn't get we didn't get any rain it cooled off really quickly and then the month of like late september and october we just didn't get anything and the lawn was like see ya see you in the spring it checked out right so i'm uh i'm this is cool i'm not i'm not surprised you got good results with a september and october application of of nitrogen so cool very very nice and and as you guys can tell here's the thing guys we're a very competitive bunch because look at what scott he's like he's like i finally put it to, to sleep this week i was the last green yard on the block which is really what it's all about right you, you know eventually you're going to lose the fight but you want to be the one that dominated the longest this season and Scott is like mission accomplished, right? And and is and if you're like you know Doug who just can't leave well enough alone, he's like, nah, I gotta dominate during the winter months too. They gotta when they drive up, they gotta see me, you know, for the rest of, for the rest of the winter and into the springtime. So uh, so yeah, it just depends on how hardcore you are about it. But uh, but yeah, I, I, again, we're just a really we're a competitive bunch when it comes to our lawns. It's kind of it's kind of odd, right? All right, Ben Raham is saying welcome back, LG. He's back in the house. All right, next is Scott. He's back. He's, he's giving us a little bit more context on it where he says, what I found was everyone shut down the fert and, and water way too early and their lawns checked out weeks ago. 
We will see next year if it was luck or science. Cheers. Yeah, so that's one thing I, I, I will agree with you on that, Scott, because I did not, um, I didn't do any irrigation. I didn't run irrigation um, very much during the month of like a lot of part of September and in October. I didn't, I hardly ran it at all. So the lawn checking out, like, could I have kept it going a bit longer had I, you know, kept up the same watering that I did during when it was actively growing? Maybe, probably. But um, but I was just like, eh, you know, I'm also, it's, let, 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 let it go to sleep. We'll see, let, let's see what happens if Mother Nature just does, does its thing. And the answer was the lawn filed a grievance and it was like, we're out. We're going back in the springtime, forget you. So uh, yeah, so do it again next year. Do it again next year and we'll see. You know, you'll see if it's luck or science. It's it's probably a bit, I wouldn't say luck so much. It's a combination of, like the nitrogen applications did not hurt. It definitely helped your cause. But also getting water, keeping water on the lawn also helped you as far as keeping it greener for longer. All right, Doug through DZ, always one to, 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 uh, to pour salt in the wound. Says, LG, you want a sticker last week. But you couldn't collect it, so it went to Mary. So see, I, see, I was going to tell him that 350. I didn't want like LG hardly ever wins. I wasn't going to go there and be like, "Hey, man, you won, but you weren't here to get it," because I don't, you know, he's kind of sensitive. But, um, but yeah, you had to go out and do that, and you had to be, you had to be the one to be like, "Yeah, you won, but Mary got it." But yeah, LG, I'm sure we'll do another. We'll do more giveaways, um, at least one more this year. And you have another chance. You know, I've got to figure out what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do in the giveaway, but um, but it'll be a good one. So make sure you are present, uh, so you have a chance to win. All right, two Trilla again. It's all it's all about the give uh, LG uh, hazing time. It's LG, it's good to have you join us today. Hope all is well to inform you that that you were the winner of an Alit mower. You know what this is like, guys. This is like whenever the Falcons lost the Super Bowl last year. Well, not last year, it feels like last year. Whenever they lost the Super Bowl, what was it, two, th like three years ago, four years ago? How long was at this point? The 28 to three Super Bowl, right? Uh, and everyone, like I remember I was, was, I was um, um, Ubering and everyone was talking about it. Oh man, are you a Falcons fan? It was so terrible. We can't believe it. You know, everyone's just giving you grief for being, for being in the city where the losing team was bad, it was from. It was so bad. I visited, I went to Tokyo in 2019. 2018, 2018 or 2019, whatever the Falcons, like it was the, it was the, 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 the summer after they lost and literally all the way in Ginza in Tokyo, which again, they don't have a football team. They only follow American football. I was there. I was in the Apple store there and they're like, Oh, where are you? They're just like, where are you from? I was like, Atlanta I says, Oh, Atlanta. Oh, the Falcons. Oh, very bad. I was like, yeah, yeah, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. On the other side of the world, you know, they all know about it. So this is kind of reminds me what LG is going through right now with, um, with as far as uh, all the grief that you guys are are giving him. So all in good fun though, right? All in good fun. I, you know, here's the thing, the Falcons for me have also become like, uh, like whenever I, someone says, hey, you know, we've got this deal closed. It's definitely a sure thing. It's, we're good to go. I said, is it is it like good, good? Or is it like Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl good? Because that means it could, could unravel at the last minute. So which which is it? So it's, you know, something good came out of it as far as that goes. So hopefully there's not too many Falcons fans in here. Not, you know, don't, don't send me hate mail, but, uh, but yeah. I just, uh, LG, I, I, I'm enjoying that you being the, the, the butt of everyone else's jokes for, for a while this evening. All right, let's see what else we have next here as far as questions. So Whiskey Blood is back. He says, yeah, I plan on doing a spring overseeding. I am dealing with some, with clay in a new construction home. Read a little bit about Lesco Carbon Pro G. Hope that helps my situation. Yeah, it will. So Essential G, which is a product that we sell in the store, you can think of Essential G as the, um, is like Carbon Pro G 2.0, but Carbon Pro G is still an excellent product. So if you have like a site one near where you, you can get it, um, by all means, uh, uh, use that. Again, I'm kind of partial to Essential G, but it's a, it's a great product. What I would tell you, Whiskey, is um, as far as how the sequencing that I would use, if you're gonna incorporate that in your seeding product, project, I would do your dethatching, right? Or turf raking, whatever, whichever you decide to go and get all the debris out and then put down your application of essential G or carbon pro G, whichever one you decide to go with and go heavy, go, go pretty heavy with it. After that, put your seed down and then you can make a pass over the lawn with like a grass rake and just, just kind of rake, rake the, uh, the seed in just to help improve that seed, that seed to soil contact. And you're going to have a really good, I think you're really going to like the results you're going to get as far as germination going that route. It's an additional step but you're putting in, you're putting in like literally half compost and half biochar. 
So the compost is great, nice, great organic material to help, you know, help with the, the, the new grass. And then the biochar is, you can think of it as, as far as um, 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 an, an additive that's going to help hold on to nutrients, hold on to water. Like there's literally no negatives to, to, to doing that um, other than just cost. Right. It's just it's another expense, but it's going you're going to like the results you get if you add that into your seeding project as as well. It's a great, 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 great product. I really like it. All right. Ben Reham says the giveaways are fun, but I'm glad I to get the stickers with the products a la uh, hot rod part style verified user pick of a sticker on a C25 sent. Feel free to share. I don't have, a, I don't have an email from you or anything as yet, Ben. Um, I got a picture of your leaves, but I don't have anything else here. Any, any sticker picture from you as yet. I know I, I've, you guys, have, some of you have sent me pictures of, uh, of them on the mowers, but I haven't gotten anything from you as yet. If it shows up, I'll, uh, I'll show it off by all means. I appreciate the support and appreciate you repping the, uh, the store, which is really cool. All right. Next up is Thurston R. He says, Hey Ron, thanks for your feedback on my sold test results. I agree with you about not going too aggressive on dethatching. I believe my dethatching this fall opened me up to nothing but Poa Triv. Yeah, I mean, and th th there's that, but also, I mean, in most cases, most lawns, they just really don't need it. You know, if you, here's a, a lawn that I would say would be a good candidate for dethatching. Say you have a lawn that's been neglected for years and years and years. Like, are you moving into a new property? It's an established lawn, but it's been neglected for a long time. There's lots of thatch, it's matted down, and you just, you wanna give it a good reset to, to start the season out, right? Like, that's a case for an aggressive dethatch to really clean things out and, and open things up and just get, and, and give the lawn a good, a nice fresh start. But you, you shouldn't have to do that every year. I wouldn't say you shouldn't have to, you don't have to do that every single year. You know, if you do a good dethatch, get the material out, from that point, you know, if you're keeping up with your regular mowing where you're just putting small amounts of debris, small amounts of clippings back into the lawn, or you're maybe even bagging your clippings, so you're not really putting hardly anything back in there, uh, and that you, you shouldn't have the issue with a lot of thatch buildup to where a very aggressive dethatch is required every single year. I mean, people do it, but it's really, I, I don't, I think you're just, you're, one, you're creating a lot of work that you don't necessarily have to um, without the, um, you know, without the benefits. Kind of like with scalping, right? Can, when it comes to scalping, you can take it all the way down to the dirt. And if you have a smaller lawn, I mean, and you want to do that, that's fine. But even just, just taking it down, you know, a quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch below the height of cut that you, you intend to maintain. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of taking, of scalping the lawn down to say half an inch. So regardless of what cutting, cutting height you're after, like half an inch is a good, is, is about as low as I would say, that's a good balance of getting, of cleaning out the lawn, getting a lot of debris out of it, and also not being too hard on your equipment. You know, getting it down to the dirt is really, is really hard on real mowers if you're using a real mower to do it. And if you're using a rotary mower, you're just, you're, you're gonna be throwing that blade out when you're done too. And, and again, the juice isn't really worth the squeeze once you start going super, super aggressive. Like the benefits come from, from cleaning a little most of the debris out and at half an inch, you're able to do that. So, so yeah, I agree with you, Thurston. I mean, if you're gonna do, you know, I, I hate to say dethatching, if you're going to do anything that I think most lawns will benefit from is turf raking. So like even like those Sun Joes, they call those dethatchers, but a lot of what they're really doing is turf raking because they don't really have the, the horsepower to really get down um, like deep into the soil and um, are deep below the the, the, the surface and really get a, and clean a lot of that thatch out. So if you're using something like that, setting it to where it's just above the surface, I think is is all you need for a uh, for a great result. That is that's those are my thoughts. Um, on on the matter. If you talk to, if you ever get a chance to talk to Roland or talk to look at any of the videos for guy for people that like over in the in the UK or any of the way of the British way of how they take care of lawns, it's the same thing. They don't they don't do an aggressive dethatch um, every single year, and if they do it, it's typically early in the season, and that's it. So it's once it's only one time. So Ben, your picture came in. You guys want to see Ben uh, rocking the uh, golf course lawn sticker on his True Cut C25? So can I move this up a little bit? So we got a true cut, a C25, nice. And he's rocking nice. That's clean, man. I like it. It's a good addition. It's a good addition to the to the to the, to the mower, man. I like it. it. Looks it looks good. It looks sharp. It's clean. I like it. Appreciate all the support, man. I really, really do. Thanks so much. All right, next up is Michael Anger. Says, hey Ron, what's going on, Michael? Thanks for coming to say hi in the live stream tonight. And then next up is LG says, LG is in the Emerald City. He is, man. His lawn is looking, that looks good. You know, you, you want, here's the thing. You want to talk about LG and give him a hard time, which we all, we all enjoy doing. 
but you can't take away, man. The man knows how to make a lawn turn green. I mean, that that is that that's uh, you know, if I didn't know better, someone would even say, oh, he painted it. But I know LG. I know what his program is like, and that is not paint. That is just lots of love and care, lots of good product application, and tons of of mowing, <laughs> tons of mowing. See, so that's so that's that's what he's like. He's like, you know, y'all gonna talk trash about me? Drop the mic. Drop the mic on on my on my lawn. So there you go. Um, this is two drills. Holy LG, you can see that from space, definitely. It does, it does look good. It does look good. I appreciate it, LG. Well, it, the products do help, but your work is what does. Like we don't, I tell you, if if I, I could retire tomorrow, if I figured out a way to bottle up stripe action, if I figured out a way to bottle up mowing and put it in a, in a, in a jar or in a bag, like if I could, I could sell mowing in liquid or granular form, I'd be a really rich guy, but. To date, no one's figured out how to do it as yet. So it's it's there's still a lot of um, you know products help uh, definitely helps a good program definitely helps. But in the end, like anything in life, right? You got to do the work. Like knowing is not enough. You actually have to do. All right, Ben Raham is up with a con with an update. He says update on the ten times rate application of prodiamine on Bermuda that was seeded in June. Maya and Blackjack both showed no ill effects and no weed so far, LOL. Yeah, I'm sure you don't have any weeds since you went 10 times the rate. And that's the thing, Bermuda is so, is so hardy. Like, you know, you, they, you know, a lot of people will say Bermuda, you know, if you, you put a new lawn in, you don't touch it with pre-emergent for a year. While that might be true for cool season grass, for, for Bermuda, really, that's really not the, I mean, I have not found that to be the case. On my lawn, that's not what happened. And on several people's lawns uh, that have written in to me and some people that are in the academy that have uh, that have written in, they've not had an issue with um, with uh, installing a new Bermuda lawn, do, uh, uh, applying pre-emergent, say two to three months afterwards, and then having any kind of ill effects. So now, cool season grass, I can't say that would be the case. But Bermuda tolerates it very well. And in your case, you went like 10 times the rate and it still is fine. So again, Bermuda's really hard, man. Unless you unless you purposely come up with a plan to kill it, it's really hard to get rid of. And, and unless, like, for me, the, the concoction that I found, Fusilate and Glyphosate, like that, that will kill Bermuda. Like I, I still, I still purposely haven't pulled out the Bermuda that's in the beds and the mulch beds, and it's still dead as as dead can be. Like no, there's not a hint of green in any of that. So, uh, so unless you you do something super super crazy, which again, 10x rate of prodiamine apparently isn't enough. Bermuda tends to tolerate it fairly fairly well. LGB nice. Listen, it's not Mary's fault. It's not Mary's fault. You weren't here. You got to be present to win. It's not. It's not her fault that you weren't here. And then she was like, you know, she, she, uh, she, she won the sticker. That's got to be present to win. Have to be present. All right. Next up is DK. It says, does fertilizer go bad or become less effective with age? The fertilizer I bought this spring still have a little left. Is that good to go for next year? And will it be just as effective? Yeah, for the most part, it will be uh, DK as long as it's kept dry. Like you keep the the bag um, closed off and it's uh, dry. You sh you're, you, it should be just just fine. Um, what a, a good sign is if you um, when you go to pour it out into the spreader, if as long as it's not clumping or or like it's it's um, clumping, it's a great best way to describe it. If it's not clumping up and like you know where it's get, where it shows, which is often evidence of moisture getting into the bag, you're gonna get a good result with it. So in other words, I would not throw it out. I would still use it. It's still gonna be effective as long as you keep it dry and the, a good way to do that is make sure the bag is like get all the air out of the bag close it off nice and tight what i would do what i do is i, I um i will um i'll open i'll i'll roll the bag up and nice and tight and i'll actually get some tape and then tape it to try and you know create like an air an airtight seal as best i can not that's not strictly necessary but i uh that's something that i that i've uh, i've done with good results so big thing is cool and dry and you should be good to go to use it next year JG's in the house leading the charge. She says, smash that like button, y'all. Yeah, guys, definitely. If you guys are here enjoying the show, having fun, it's going to probably be a little bit shorter show tonight because there's not that many people hanging out. But for the 50 or so of us that are here, hit that like button. It doesn't cost you guys anything. It's free. It's free. It didn't cost anything to support the channel. You know what I mean? All right. Next up is Michael Anger. He says, hey, Ron, I went to Wheel Rollers, Rollers last Saturday and they are closed, and they are closed. Is it because of the winter season, or do you know if that is their hours even in the spring and summer? Uh, yeah, so I, they're open Monday through Friday. I don't believe they have weekend hours. I don't believe they're open on Saturdays, at least uh, not that I've ever known. No, typically Monday through Friday is when Real Rollers is open. The uh, Now, when they close in the afternoon, 
it tends to be a little bit, er, um, it tends to be a little bit earlier um, outside of the growing season. That's what they've done in years past. But uh, but the weekends they've never been open to my knowledge. It's always been like a Monday through Monday through Friday uh, type business. I mean, the store's open, the the website is open. Like you can place your orders online, obviously during the weekend. Like that's open twenty four seven. But as far as finding someone there on the weekends, typically not so much. Not unless Lee is there, maybe you know doing inventory or doing something else. But I, in general, I don't believe they receive customers on, not regularly anyway, not on the weekends, not on the weekends. So, uh, so yeah, uh, check the website, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Monday through Friday is when they are open. All right. Next up is Whiskey Blood. He says, going to spam you with another question, brother. All right. This is your last question, Whiskey. This is it. I mean, I, I, you asked like three now. This is, I'm, I'm just giving you our time. All right. He says, what's your opinion on straw versus peat moss versus starter pellets? Uh, this would be good for new seating area. Okay, so I've never used any of them. I've never used straw or peat moss or um, starter seed pellet, pellets. I'll, um, as far as uh, what I hear from people that they like that they that they that that do a lot of seeding, peat moss out of those three is the one that wins. It it's, it tends to be a bit messy. Um, but as far as out of the three, peat moss is what most people um, will would say is like the the superior the most superior of the three the the thing is you have to make sure you keep it um damp keep this the the uh the peat moss and the soil damp but it does a good job of insulating and keeping moisture on the new grass seed straw i've heard about and the starter pellets i think you're talking about some of the um i've seen some of the grass seeds where they will have like uh it's like a like a blue wrapper that has like a little bit of fertilizer in there and um just like it, it so i think what is what it looks like to me it's it's, it's a it's a like a wrapper to help it hold moisture so when you water it it's kind of like in a cocoon with moisture so it doesn't dry out um i don't know how well those really those really work i would say that if you do a good job on your prep work so we thin out, thin out the lawn a little bit get your essential g down put your c down and then water it even with just doing that you're going to get a good result if you are so inclined to also do peat moss as well, it's only going to help. And then uh, the only thing that's really going to really, um, uh, that's going to, from that point to help with you getting a good result with your germination is ensuring you're not allowing the lawn to dry out, not allowing the seed to dry out. So it for the first, depending on the kind of grass you're growing, um, every day you're going to be watering to to ensure that it doesn't dry out, and that's that's pretty much what it takes. Again, the peat moss, in my opinion, is is somewhat optional, but you can, uh, but yeah, you can absolutely do that as well if you have the time to uh, to to add it on top of all the other steps that I mentioned. And remember, the thing that with all the prep work you're doing, make sure you keep the ground, um, the seed watered. Like most seeding projects don't fail from preparation. They fail from um, inadequate water once you go through and put the seed down. People will be like, well, put the seed down, water once, and then like, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna grow. And that's, that's just not the, that's not the case. You have to ensure you keep it moist for, for a few weeks. For ryegrass, out of the three, out of like, um, for cool season grass, out of rye, fescue, and Kentucky bluegrass, uh, rye is gonna germinate the fastest and then fe and then fescues will be will follow them fairly closely behind and then last will be Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass is a, like along the lines of how uh, Bermuda will often germinate. Bermuda is typically a 2 to 3 week type thing and KBG is around the same thing. So it depends on what uh, what grass seed you're doing your overseed with. All right, Doug 350 z is chiming in. He says, Whiskey Blood, if you have a super sod near you, they have an overseeding mix of compost and humic. I would do that. That's a good option as well, too. Yep, you, if you want to get it in bulk, you can absolutely do that. And if you decide to go that route, this link, which even though it's for top dressing, will save you um, will save you a little bit if you when you when you buy from their store. So let me put this in the chat. Um, I think that's correct. So whiskey, it's going to be like $10. It's not like it's a life-changing amount of money, but it's, it still helps, right? Still uh, something. So at whiskey blood. So there is that if you decide to go the super solid route. But again, essential G is, is a great option as well. You, you got you got tons of tons of choices. Tons of choices. All right, Two Trilla says, last comment, I promise LG. <laughs> he says, you uh, your yard needs to be on the front of a furt bag. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. That is, I mean, it looks good enough to do that for sure. I mean, that that's a good looking lawn. I don't care who you are. I mean, that's that. I mean, you can look at the stripe action. I mean, you can tell 
he, it looks like the most recent mow was diagonal, but you can even, if you look closely, you can even see that he mowed from, um, how can I describe this? He mowed from like right to, um, from right to left as well too. You can look, you can see some faint diagonal stripes right to left as well. So you can tell that LG definitely mixes it up uh, every time he mows and that stripe action reflects that. Dwayne's World is up next. He says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. Everyone, let's hit that like button ever so gently. I appreciate you, Dwayne's World. Thanks, sir. And then next up is Daryl from Fairway, Bermuda. Daryl is a beast, guys. I got to tell you, for Daryl is all the way in Mississippi, and he made the trip out to the Real Rollers Turf Park. Uh, you know, it's been a month ago at this point, but it was really, really appreciate all the love and support making the trip to come and hang out and for a few hours and get to run the outlet and everything else. So hopefully you're doing well, uh, Daryl. Looking forward to good things from you next year. In, on your YouTube channel, so just keep going, keep going. His comment is, what's up, Ron? I had great results this season using a Celeprint SC at Headway G. Two great products I'll be using next season. Thanks. Yeah, man, I mean, once you find out what works, stick with it, like next year, next, some of you guys have been asking, you know, what are you changing up next year? There may be some, um, some new introductions in the way of fertilizer potentially next year, we'll see. But as far as the main program, like you guys, can pretty much guarantee there's gonna be a scalp in the spring. There's gonna be an insecticide and fungicide application in the springtime. There's gonna be a lot of mowing. There's gonna be plant growth regulator and lot for a lot. Of, it's gonna be, it's gonna be what, I, what I normally do. Next year, I'm probably not gonna top dress. If I do, you guys are not allowed to bring this live stream up where I said I'm not gonna top dress salon next year because I'm probably not gonna top dress salon next year. I just, I mean, I've done it every year. Is it really necessary to do it every single year? Probably not, right? I can probably let one year go by and not do it. And if it does, I'm sure you guys will be good sports to Trilla. Ben, all you guys will be nice and not be like, hey, Ron, remember when you said, you know, November 18th that you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna top dress your lawn? And look, you did. All right, so next up is Dwayne's Rule. He has a question. He says, Ron, what are your thoughts on the next evolution of lawn care equipment being less about batteries and more so about autonomous mowers? Um... I, I think it depends on the person. I think it depends on the person. You know what I mean? It's like, um, I think that autonomous mowers definitely have a place. I think that for people that want a great looking lawn and well, they, they want a great looking lawn and they don't want to put the time into being out there mowing and they, they just don't enjoy it and they don't really care about stripe action because that's one thing that I've not seen as yet that autonomous mowers do a good job of. They don't, they don't, they don't stripe the lawn very well. And you know, for me, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, if for someone like that, uh, then I think they're a great fit. But I don't, but for the the, the lawn enthusiasts, so you, and I think that most of us are, right? Most people, that, you got 60 people in here that are you know hanging out on a Friday night talking about, about, the, about grass. I mean, for those type of people, for people like us, I don't know that there's, that it's going to be a huge, it's gonna, we're, I don't think we're necessarily the market for that. You know what I mean? It's almost like asking or talking about people that have, uh, take about like an automatic transmission car versus a, like a, or a dual clutch transmission car, automatic transmission car versus a manual transmission. In many ways, um, like a dual clutch transmission is faster. It never misses shifts. You can never like money shift it. You can't like, you know, you can't blow a, you can't blow synchros or, or blow an engine um, by, you know, downshifting into, into the wrong gear. Um, so in many ways it's faster. Hence is why you see, you know, you know, those paddle shift car um, transmissions in like Formula One and in, in the, in the, in the highest ends of motorsports, that's what you, that's what you find. However, for the, for the, car enthusiast, right? For the person that's really into cars, I mean, a lot of the people still love a manual transmission. It is slower, it is less efficient, but there is there is something to be said for manually rolling your own gears, manually, you know, like, you know, doing, you know, the clutching in while your foot's on the brake and giving it a blip and then and sliding in, sliding into gear as you downshift. So it's, so there is a, um, so for, so for people that are into their lawns and like working on their lawns, I don't think the autonomous mower is really gonna have a play as much as um, for like commercial properties, absolutely. For people, you know, a good example could be someone with a really large property, then and, and maybe they only wanna manually mow just their front lawn. That's a case for an autonomous mower. You can put it in the area where you don't really care. You want it to be cut, you want it to look nice, but you don't wanna actually have to be out there mowing it yourself. But if you, for the area that is like up front, that's gonna be like the showpiece, I don't think that an autonomous mower will match the um, the quality of cut and definitely not the stripe action that you can get from doing it yourself. So I, I think it's a good thing. I think that autonomous mowers are are a good thing. It's gonna it's gonna be an, an, an additional option 
um, in the industry, but I think they will have limited reach for the for the typical in enthusiast, and even really until the price comes down, even for most homeowners, because they're still kind of expensive. And uh, and you know, for the most homeowners, you know, there people are, are used to spending, you know, three four hundred dollars less than that in some cases on a lawnmower. You know, and most of the decent, the good autonomous mowers, you got to get into four figures, into you know, over the thousand dollar price point to get like a really good one that has good, good runtime, um, weather sealing, like all those things that make it really good. Um, so, and that will come down over time, but right now they're just not, not there yet. So, I think it's a good addition, kind of like the pivot to away from gas to electric. That's going to be a thing like that. If you ask me if we are eventually all going to be using electric mowers, I'd say absolutely. Within the next, um, certainly within the next ten years, we're all going, we're probably all going to have have electric mowers um, than um, than gas, you know. So that's, but it's again autonomous. I don't think they're going to displace. Um, they're going to displace what we what we like to do as yet. In other words, you, whenever someone produces a robot mower that can do that, then I'll be impressed. Then talk to me. Like when you when you can drop stripes like that consistently and they're nice and straight and looking clean, then I'd say yeah. Now now there's there's less there's less and less reason to go out and and uh, and do it yourself, but they're not again. They're not not quite there yet. All right. Next up is Mr. Ben Raham. He says at Whiskey Blood, even sterile straw will have weed seeds for sure. But if it's a large area, it may be more economical. Peat is good, but costly for large areas. But there are questionable environmental impact. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you, you know, whiskey. I've never used peat moss. I've never used peat moss on any of my seeding projects. Literally, I just I haven't. Mainly because I've got a, a fairly large lawn to have to deal with. And I've been able to get decent results without doing that because the big thing is do a good job preparing and then keep it, keep water on it, keep it moist to where it doesn't dry out and you're going to get a good result. So that's a good traditional good points there as well that Ben brought up. He says, thanks, Doug. I'll look into that in case there's a location close for sure, for sure. And Doug 50Z is weighing in. He says, uh, whiskey blood, I used peat moss as top dressing last year. But I did prepare, prefer the super sod mix. Also, if you overseed frequently, invest in a compost slash peat spreader. Sure. Yep. All good advice, guys. We're running, we're running low. We're going to be, a, it's going to be a short show tonight. You guys don't have that many questions, not many people in here. And uh, it's still fun. We're still having a great time. Still having lots and lots of fun. And Whiskey saying he's considering a KBG slash rye mix. I've read that KBG is traffic tolerant. And ryegrass will germinate quickly. That's true. Fixing some of the mud issues. Yeah, I will. I'll tell you. Like I did. I wish I'd taken more pictures of it. But I did. A, a, I had a planter with um, three different planters. I had one with zoysia, one with ryegrass, one with Bermuda grass. And by far, the ryegrass uh, germinated the fastest. Like within five days, it was it was coming up. The Bermuda was second. The Arden Fifteen, like nine, ten days, you started seeing a little, little, you know, little baby Bermuda coming in. And the zoysia by far took its time. Like Bermuda, the, the, the zoysia, the zoysia never really filled in and got super thick until like the end of the season. It took a long time to grow in, but now it still looks great. And I still have the I kept the zoysia one. It's it's the one that's on. You guys see in the videos, I'll have like a little like the little planter, a little plot there with like grass. That's zoysia. It's compadre zoysia. So uh, so yeah. But I agree with your assessment that rye is going to germinate and grow in quite a bit faster than Kentucky uh, bluegrass. Uh, ben Raham says, hey, Daryl, for Bermuda, good comment. I am a convert to a Celeprin. Uh, let's let the pollination live. I switched this year with one app. I had zero grubs or any pests or worms and bees are okay. That's the thing too, because a, a, a you know Wild Caravan is an excellent product, right? It's a great product as far as a combination fungicide and insecticide. And where, where I really would say a or, or, or Caravan is um, the, the bread and butter for that product is say a person that doesn't really have any, you know, any... Um, any um, active um, issues with armyworms in their lawn, or no, re no reason to think they are going to have them, and they're good, and they look, they're looking for a a combination product to save a little bit of money. That is where Caravan really shines. So, like in you know the May timeframe next year, Caravan is if, if you're someone that just wants to do a preventative fungicide and insecticide, good option. I will still say that Headway and Acelaprin, while more expensive, is a superior way to do it 
than to do Caravan because Headway, one, you're getting two different fungicides, electroshobin and propiconazole, and then as an insecticide, chlorantranilopril, which is the active ingredient that's in a celeprin, is, is superior to what's, it's, it, in my opinion, it's one of the best insecticides to use on residential lawns because it, it, it kills everything that the, that the insecticide in Caravan does, but it also is effective against turf caterpillars. So like your army worms, sod web worms, web worms, like all those, it, it takes care of all of them. And also while also being, um, you know, very good for the environment compared to other insecticides. So it's, it's a bit more expensive, but it's a great product. I mean, that's that's the that's only what I'm gonna be using on my lawn going forward is a Celeprin and Headway G as a um, as that combination. So good stuff, great. appreciate you chiming in. Ben, and then uh, Doug, <laughs> Doug UGC says, has save the manuals. Yeah, man, I mean, everyone's done it. Everyone that has a manual strand transmission knows, man. It's always, you've always been like, you know, you're getting aggressive and then you can, and you, you put it in the gear and, and drop the clutch and, and you know, RPM sits up and you try and clutch in really quickly. So everyone's done it, but there is, there is more enjoyment, in, I think anyway, of driving a manual transmission car than an automatic. Now for commuting, you have to sit in traffic. No, it's a pain. But for like spirited driving or just just in just just the pure joy of driving, manuals are really hard to beat. For the pure joy of like creating a golf course lawn, it's really tough to beat a sharp rotary mower or a sharp reel mower and just having the, the fun and the relaxed for frankly the relaxation of just laying your stripes. You know what I mean? Like it's like it's 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 not. Um, if all you really cared about is your lawn being cut, you could pay a service to come do it. But I think we do it because we enjoy the process. We enjoy the like the the, the sense of um, accomplishment, and then the fact that you're the one that's out there putting in the work and and making it happen yourself. So that's 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 something that that a robot is never going to um, to going to ever be able to to uh to match. There's just like a, there's like an artistry to it, right? Kind of like with music, right? Like music, you can you can do a lot of, um, you know, with, with a lot of the the the, the new ways of making music, um, you can elect you can use electronics to shortcut it. But there's still a lot of art artistry in in doing it yourself, like vi making videos. The same thing. You can there's a lot of artistry in doing it yourself. So, so there you go. So I don't I, I will not own, I don't think I don't see myself owning an a automated mower anytime soon. I I enjoy the I enjoy the uh, the process of doing it myself. All right, Gary Kelly Jr. is in the house. He says, hey, Ron, I'm thinking about going with Lesco products next year. What do you think of the weed and feed or pre-emergent with fertilizer? I've always did separate applications, never a combo. It depends on which one. So I'm not sure if you're talking about by their weed and feed, like uh, the 007. So that's like a prodiamine. I mean, they have different, different active ingredients in it, but they have like a, a prodiamine product and a dithiapyr product. So if that's what you're talking about, should be great. Should be should be absolutely fine. I've not used it, but it's. I mean, there's a lot of different companies that make a, a 007, um, like a weed and feed type product. I, I think that that can work well for your pre-emergent app. I would not. I'm not a fan of doing weed and feeds throughout the growing season. So, like, if you're going to use like something like um like like this, like let me show you here, because we actually carry one in the store. If you use something like like this, right? Like say like Dithi just sold out. If you use something like Dithiap here, uh, 007, like this is good as a pre-emergent to use um, at the beginning of the season. But even if you could find one of these products that has a post-emergent herbicide in it, I would, I don't, I'm not a fan of putting, of putting out herbicide every time you fertilize the lawn. You know what I mean? So like really, if you're doing it right, you're going to be doing pre-emergent in the spring, pre-emergent in the fall. You're going to mow the lawn a couple times per week while that grass is actively growing. And you're going to be using like post-emergence very sparingly. So if you got warm season grass, like Celsius uncertainty, or if you got cool season grass, tenacity and sedgehammer, you're going to be using those very sparingly to clean up the little bit of weeds that you still have in your lawn. You should not have to apply herbicides to your lawn every time you fertilize it. If that's the case, you're doing something wrong because between pre-emergent and then regular mowing, that should should really do a lot for allowing your grass to become the dominant plant in your lawn and the weeds to really have to take a back seat. So I, I don't know um, what other Let's Go products you're talking about, but um, but yeah, I mean, if you're talking about just their pre-emergent, like there's yours or seven, that should be fine if you want to, to go that route. All right, Fairman Bermuda, Daryl says, thanks for the kind words. I really enjoyed Real Rollers uh, uh, in this year. Yep, man, hopefully they do it again next year. It should be a fun time. 
And then uh, next, uh, G Free says Leroy, Leroy Jenkins. We talking about World of Warcraft? We, we talk. What are we talking about? I'm, uh, I'm missing you. I'm missing what you're saying there, uh, uh, G Free. All right. Next up is 100 Yard Alchemist says, "How do you feel about sprinkler systems?" Mm, I'm a fan. I think they're, I think they're a good addition to your, um, to your lawn. I think it, here's the, the thing: sprinkler systems are very, are very much a convenience. So. You, you, they save you from having to get out there and drag hoses around to water your lawn. Um, after you put out, like, say, fertilizer, you put out um, like a, your pre-emergent. It makes it really—it's really easy. It's much easier to get out there with your phone and just say, "Turn the sprinklers on for this cycle and just run it," than having to drag hoses around. So it's very much a convenience thing, and I, I think in many ways that they allow you to save. They, I think you'll, they allow you to save water versus dragging hoses because you're you can you can every zone will be watered the same way every time like the same amount of water is going on each part of your lawn each time you run the irrigation system whereas with you run like sprinkler or you, you take like you're dragging a hose around with um with manual irrigation you may not put it in the same spot you may run it for longer you may you may not do it at all so for a just for a means of just having a more consistent watering program I am, I am a fan of sprinklers. I am, I am a fan of having um, in-ground in -ground irrigation. I am a fan of that. And then, uh, so hopefully that helps 100 Yard Alchemist. If you need anything else, uh, let me know. Uh, Randy Velarde says, does a celebrant control snails? No, I don't I don't believe so. I don't believe it does. I don't believe it's, it's, uh, it's labeled for killing snails. You have to get something else uh, for that. I, could, I think I was asked that question last year or earlier this year, and um, when I looked into it, there's 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 a different product you can use for that, but not not a celeprin, not a celeprin. All right, Rob's blazer is up next. He says I have Bermuda Tiff uh, two point four nineteen, but I also have lots of trees. Uh oh, here we go. Here we go. And I, we, we all know I haven't read the rest of it yet, but we know where this is going, right? So Tiff two point four nineteen and lots of trees. Probably a shade comment, right? He says, uh, what seed would you use for heavy shaded areas to blend in? I for for Bermuda I wouldn't you you you'd be you'd be wasting your time um, and money in my opinion. So the general rule, Rob, is if Bermuda is not growing in that area. So let's say the area is getting enough fertilizer um, and enough water. So there's nothing like nothing weird going on with it. If Bermuda is not growing there now, adding more seed, another more Bermuda Bermuda grass seed is not going to make it grow. So your options are to you know, raise the canopy, so figure out how a way to get more sunlight in that area, because if you're able to do that, that might improve your chances of it growing. But Bermuda is really a grass type. It's, it's probably one of the least tolerant grass types to lack of sunlight. You know, it, you know, they say it needs you know six, seven, six, seven hours of sunlight, but really it, it needs all the sunlight, seven, eight plus hours of direct sunlight. And by direct, I mean not passing through trees. It's like you have the sun and there's nothing between the sun and the grass other than the like space and the atmosphere. That's it, like just direct sunlight hitting it, not passing through trees or anything else like that. Any kind of shrubbery or any kind of trees that, this, that the light has to pass through, sunlight has to pass through, is going to cause it to be a bit thinner. So your option for that area is if you want to go with, um, one, you could like, you could do like a mulch, it may turn into a mulch bed if you wanted. You could use a fescue. So if it's heavily shaded, you could use a fescue. Uh, that that tends to do better in shaded areas by far than Bermuda, but it's not going to look like Bermuda. It's not going to blend in. Like the two don't look anything alike. Like fescue and Bermuda don't look anything alike. Fescue and rye don't look anything alike. So um, if your goal is to have it match, it's not. It's really not. It's really not going to happen. They're not going to. They're they're going to look different. So it depends on depends on on how much it really bothers you or how big a how big a deal it is for you to going to be to have you know two different grass types. If you're mowing them, well, well fescue you can't mow them too short. But let's say you're mowing your Bermuda taller, right? So you're mowing your your Bermuda at like I don't know. It pains me to say this, like three inches, say like two and a half, three inches, and you're mowing your fescue at the same height, which is a little bit short for fescue, but you could probably get away with it. Then it for the for the person for someone that's like that is not a grass nerd that's just looking at the lawn, they're probably not going to notice too much of a difference. They're going to say, "Oh, look, the grass over there, the color's a little bit different under the trees," but it could be because it's shaded, right? Um, but if um, but if you're saying that for you, if you want it for you to all look like it's going to match, it's that's just that's going to be that's going to be tough. Like shade tolerant Bermuda um, is not a thing; it does not exist. Like it does, it, there there's some that do a, a little bit better, but none of it like Bermuda need does not like um, shade. 
if it's not growing, in other words, if, gra if the grass is not growing there now, your choices are either remove the tree, like seriously raise the canopy, or use a different type of grass like uh, like a fescue, or just turn the area into a mulch bed. If it's a small area around the tree, just say, hey, you know, I'm not gonna have grass here. I'm just gonna put like mulch in or um, put in like um, like mondo like mondo grass or some some other kind of ground cover that looks like decorative, but and 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 it and it's and I, I would say that's probably a better way to go because it'll like a like a like a decorative ground cover will look different enough from the Bermuda that anyone that looks at it is going to say, oh, he meant to do that. You know what I mean? It's, he's not trying to match the grasses. Like that's like, you know, like a, a decoration around this tree. And then he has his lawn. And I think that's the way I would be, I would lean more towards than trying to get a grass that will match Bermuda because you're just not going to get it to grow in the shade, unfortunately. It's not going to, not going to happen. Not going to happen. I don't want you to waste a bunch of time and money uh, trying to. All right, uh, next up, uh, Ben Raham says, manuals are hard to beat until you really want to go fast in a straight line. Yeah, I mean, again, if, if your thing is to just to go like f fast in a straight line or even fast around a race, around a circuit, right? I mean, even around a racetrack or around a, a you know, like Road Atlanta or any, any kind of circuit, like a dual clutch or like an automated transmission is is faster because you, n you literally never miss a shift. Um, they shift so quickly that as far as like upsetting the balance of the car, it's a lot, lot less than a manual. So it's just there, they are, if, if all you are looking for is the tool, the absolute best tool for the job, then a, then like an automated shift to transmission is superior, but it is not the most enjoyable way to drive a car to me. I mean, some people will disagree with me, but to me, it's just not as much. Not as much fun. As is evidence why Porsche, even now, still offer manual transmissions in some of their cars. I mean, they'll tell you, hey, the PDK is way faster. Like, even they've got to the point now where weight-wise, there's not a ton of difference. Like, the PDK is not that much more heavier, not a ton heavier anyway than the manual gearbox, but they still offer the manual gearbox, particularly in their um, their GT, their GT cars, uh, because people people want them, right? Because it's, it's not, because you think about it, right? For, while I'm looking for the next comment, we can talk about this a bit. Like, for, unless you're trying to go to jail, like going, you know, you, you you can only go so fast. The speed limit in most high in most parts of the country is like 70 miles an hour. That's as, as fast as it goes. If you go like 70, 75, you might be able to get away with that, right? But, you know, being able to go super fast in a straight line, it's limited as how many opportunities you're going to have to do that and not like get the attention of the police. Whereas a manual, you can drive a manual well within the speed limit, just, you know, entering your neighborhood, driving in and downshifting. I mean, you, can, you don't have to drive a manual transmission fast to enjoy it. Whereas dual clutches or, or manuals tend to be kind of boring unless you're really, unless you're really ripping on them. You know what I mean? So there's that. Like, like my super has, it has like a, it's a, it's an automatic. It's, it's fast. It shifts really nice, but it's, it's frankly kind of boring to drive compared to a um, manual unless you're absolutely ripping on it. And then it's, then it's a ton of fun to drive, but then that's also uh, bad for your license. All right, uh, Ben Raham is up next here. He says, we need an after party after the next Real Rollers event. Get in touch, y'all. We'll have to see. Maybe we can make that happen. But because th the challenge with that, Ben, is that is um, if some people drive from out of state. So if we had any kind of an after thing, after party afterwards, you know, people would have to, to stay in town. And there, there's that. I guess for the locals, we could do it. But a lot of, many people that drove from out of state, they just drew, made a day trip to drive in town, hang out, and then drive back. And um, so for them, they may not want to do as law as as much as that oh i got you ben uh, uh leroy yeah my test plot uh what type of grass leroy was um let me think leroy what was leroy leroy was it leroy the was leroy the the bermuda leroy was the, was the bermuda wasn't it he was that was the yard in 15 i think leroy was the yard in 15 um there's Alice Bob and I think Leroy. And I think Leroy was the Arden 15. It's either the Arden 15 or the Zoysia, but I think it was the Arden 15 uh, uh, G-Free. All right, Greg Leon is up next. He says, hey, hey, Ron, happy Thanksgiving. I am having a lot of trouble with Poanua and I am spraying Celsius uncertainty and can barely keep up with the new patches. I did pre-emergent in... October, so a little bit late on the pre immersion. Okay, what else can I do to take care of it, of it all? Uh, of all of it, my lawn is still green, but I have lots of yellow areas now for my spring. Thank you. Okay, so the thing I would say is, if, is all if all you have is Poa, don't spray Celsius. Like these two are a great combination, but if all you want is your all you're targeting is Poanua, put this aside. 
we'll, we'll save the Celsius for next year and just use certainty. So this is all you really need for POA. This with surfactant is all is we'll, we'll get it done. So I so say if you're still spraying, don't don't put down uh, Celsius. Just go with uh, just go with certainty. It will do the trick. Now once you get your get ahead of it, and it sounds like you see your lawn's green, but once you get ahead of it, the pre emergent that you applied in October should help you out as far as you know throughout the rest of the season and in, it, throughout the winter and into the springtime. But anything that germinated before that, which you are going to have some, because again, really, I, I, I'm a fan of getting my pre-emergent down um, like early September, like late August, early September, which I know is early, but again, I don't have any POA in my lawn. So that's what getting it down earlier than even a lot of people will tell you to, I think is the better way to go. But in your case, you're already here. We're already here. Um, so just keep doing what you're doing. You've got your you've got your pre emergent down. Don't apply anymore. It's it is working, but you're just gonna have to kill off what you've currently got in the lawn. And certainty with surfactant is really the best product uh, to do that. Don't don't mix Celsius with. There's no reason to to do that because Celsius doesn't really do a whole lot for POA. Uh, this is what you want. So just save the Celsius for next year. And um and yeah and and you'll get ahead of it, man. You will you will get ahead of it. Just keep just keep smacking it with uh, with certainty, and it will you will you'll you'll get ahead of the curve. Um, so that you'll, you'll be able to kill off what is what, what germinated prior to your pre-emergent and that you shouldn't have as much, um, you should, in other words, it should be reducing. As you keep going through this process, the amount of POA in your lawn should become less and less and less and less over, over time. Sorry you're dealing with that. Sorry you're dealing with that, not fun. Definitely, definitely not fun. All right, Vahid Navi is up next. He says, hey Ron, if we are doing pre-emergent or post, how long um, can we do fertilizer for recovery? Okay, so they're, they're different, um, um, but he, so if you're doing pre, if you're spraying pre, pre emergent, post emergent, they are not, they're not linked to your fertilizer app. So unless you're using some type of a weed and feed product that has pre emergent and fertilizer in it, let's, let's say you're using like a, um, I mean, most of them have relatively low um, um, NPK, but let's say you're using a product that had like a, I don't think this even exists. So you're using like a, like, like a, like a triple 12 uh, um, fertilizer that also has pre-emergent. Let's say that existed, right? And you're, you're, you're putting that on your lawn. In that case, you would not wanna do a full rate fertilizer app immediately afterwards because you've already put down nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus um, with, your, with your weed and feed. But in most cases, if all you're doing is strictly a pre-emergent, like say all you're doing is putting down, I don't have any here to show you, but let's say all you're doing is you're putting down just like prodiamine, then you you could do fertilizer the exact same day if you wanted to. There there it's not the two aren't linked. Is guess is what I'm trying to say. You can do pre-emergent. You could do fertilizer same day if you want. No uh, no problem. Um, and the same is true for for post-emergent. Um, you could do them in the same day if you if you wanted to. The only thing I would say is this right when it comes to pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides, for pre-emergent. Pre-emergent needs to be watered in for it to work, right? So if you were gonna do like a pre-emergent and do a fertilizer on the same day and then water them both in, that's a great strategy. If you're doing post-emergent and fertilizer, most fertilizer, unless you're doing like a like a foliar app, like a liquid fertilizer application, like if you're using, if you're using a granular, so something like, uh, like this, like Cumic Max or something similar, if you are putting a granular down, that also needs to be watered in, but post-emergent herbicides, most of them do not. So let's say you are using like, like Celsius and Certainty. These are like a good post-emergent herbicide combination for warm season grass. If you were say spraying this tomorrow morning, right? And you were also wanting to fertilize tomorrow because tomorrow is your day to put your fertilizer down. What I would do is you could put your fertilizer down, then spray any weeds you wanted with this combination, the, the, the um, Celsius Certainty combo, but then wait until the following day before you water the fertilizer in. Because for these, you really need to spray them and they need to be allowed to dry on the leaf of the, of the weed you're targeting to get the best results. So that's really the only caveat when it comes to, to mixing uh, post-emergent herbicides with um, fertilizer. When it comes to pre-emergent, you can do them both at the same time and then water afterwards. And only, only with post-emergence do you need to um, stagger, to give it some time. So put down, to, you put down your fertilizer, do your, your post-emergent and then, or, and then uh, give it a day so to really, to really allow this to dry and then water your fertilizer in and then you'll be you'll be just fine. So so yeah, so hope that helps. I think that's the question you're at, you're asking and if um if not ask again and I'll I'll revisit it, but I think that's what you were were after. It's a good question. Good question. 
All right, next up is a Ben Raham. He says, beginner and or to expert, we are in this together. Help, don't judge, be good, y'all. Pick scent of, of the next gen if Papa does it, if they will. This is the next generation. Oh, okay. This is cool. <laughs> That's right. You gotta, you gotta raise them up right. So if you ask, you ask if there's gonna be, um, you know, if there's only gonna be a bunch of robot mowers, no, because robot mowers can't do that, right? You know, robot can't, you know, you know the automated lawn equipment can't, uh, can't do that. He got, got the little guy, get the little guy going. You're raising him, raising him up right, man. That's good. Nice. I like it. I like it. I like it. You know, the funny thing, you guys are not going to believe this. You know, I'm really into my lawn now, but when I was younger, I hated mowing grass. I absolutely hated it because every weekend my dad, like they have, um, the island that I grew up on, they, uh, my parents had, um, like some property. So on the weekends was like to go, we're either going to go cut grass, either I had to cut grass, like where the house was, or we're going up to the quill and going to cut grass there. or going to go out to like Newton pasture and cut grass there. So it was always like some so at some point we're, 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 we're cutting grass somewhere. And I didn't like mowing, mowing lawns, I hated it. And then look what happens, lo and behold, when you get older, you turn into your, to, your, uh, to your parents, right? To your dad, so go figure. Go figure, it turns into like one of the biggest lawn nerds, right? All right, uh, LG is chiming in on the comment about sprinkler system where he says, sprinkler systems are convenient, especially for watering and fertilizer, especially when there's no rain in sight but I get better results from running impact sprinklers attached to hoses. So there you go. So you have um, LG, he enjoys uh, the, the the manual route of using sprinklers to hoses. I am a big fan of the in-ground irrigation. I mean, I could, given the size of my lawn, LG, could you imagine having to drag hoses around? That would be, I mean, it's not so much having to always move it, it's the setup and cleanup too, right? Because first I gotta get the hoses out, get them all like all done out, connect them up, put the sprinkler down and then I got to, you know, let it run for a while, then move it and then move it. And it's just, and then once I'm done watering, I got to pick it all up and wrap it up and put it away until the next time. So it's just, it's for, for me, for me, it's kind of like, it, and it's just maybe different for everybody. But for me, I really like mowing grass. Like I enjoy, like that is my therapy. I enjoy being out there mowing the lawn. I can think about, you know, karate or think about work or think about stuff. It's just like my, or think about ideas for YouTube videos. It's my time just to get out there and just think and just kind of just, just do nothing but just mow the lawn. Right, um, but I don't particularly like the other aspects of lawn care. Like I don't really like edging. I, I just, I'm not. I mean, edging the lawn is not bad, but I don't like trimming shrubs. I don't. That's why I don't really have a, like plants and flower breads. I don't like. I do any of that stuff. I don't like trimming. I don't like doing that kind of stuff. So I know that for me, from my personality type, for me, like having to move sprinklers around all the time would not be fun. Like I just wouldn't do it. So that's why I like. I'm a prime candidate of someone that needs irrigation. Otherwise, I just wouldn't like. I'd probably just the lawn just wouldn't get as much water as it needs to because it's just it's just too much. It's too much of the kind of work that I don't enjoy doing to go that route for me. But that's again, everyone is different. All right, Gary Kell is up next. He says, Ron, I just got my new Flow Zone sprayer. Nice. It's a nice piece of kit, man. Those are nice sprayers. Yep, I'm outside Chicago and I just ordered one. Loaded her up with water and played outside as my wife. <laughs> As my wife shook her head, she is now in the basement waiting for spring. Man, look, you were just testing it out, just making sure that it, you know, it was, it was you got a good unit, that the spray rate's the way you wanted it. You got to check, you got to check out the tips. You know, it's just you gotta you gotta get a little test run. I get it. I get it, you know, I get it. I mean, here, I'll put you this way, Gary. There are far, far worse things you could be doing than, than playing with your new backpack sprayer. So again, this is uh this is probably the wrong group if you're looking for people to tell you that you should not be doing that. We're not exactly the best accountability group when it comes to not doing stuff in your lawn or with lawn equipment. Ben's got a good question here, it's good. He says, what are the rest of y'all Bermuda guys doing in the off season? I hope to step up the edging hardscape game. Um, for me, I still mow every now and then, and then um, like work has been pretty crazy right now, so that's taking up much of my time, and then just karate and just other stuff. I got into fantasy football this year, so I've been doing that some, but that's not really takes a lot of time. Really, you just put a line up in and just, you know, yell the TV on Sunday. Um, but a whole lot of, outside of that, just recharging, you know, just recharging and getting, thinking about ideas for for content for next year and, and that type of thing. So not as much out in the lawn for me uh, as maybe some of the rest of you guys say, because I've got other things that I'm, I'm working on. Again, some of it's related to like, Lawn Curie on the YouTube channel, but that doesn't require me actually being out there to do it. Doug uh, agrees with me. He says, that's true, Ron. I have a 992S seven-speed manual, and they said it's more 
fun than the Turbo S. Yeah, I believe I, it's it's true because again, like from like you look at some of these cars, like like not cars have gotten to the point where they have so much power and they are so fast, but the speed limit is still 70 miles an hour. So again, unless you are going to take it to a track day, which can be kind of risky, um, you know, or you want a chance get or, or you want a chance having like a, a not great meeting with law enforcement, like you you know, it's better to have. I I think for like for pure driving enjoyment, manuals for me are more fun than um than automated um automated transmissions the only thing that's kind of cool i will say while i'm looking for the next comment about like the um that i like about the supra is that like if you like if you like your pops on downshifts like your like like pops on the overrun and i know you can tune that into manuals but um but like the paddle shift cars do a really good job of that like the ignition cut that they like they make and the, the pops that they make when you downshift those are pretty sweet compared to a manual you can do it with a manual but they're not they're not quite as good um, as, or you're not, they're not as tunable, I should say, as, um, you know, what you can do with like a, like a manual paddle shift gearbox. So, so that, that's one thing that, that they have as an advantage. All right. Uh, next up is Vahid Navi. He says, what's a good product to kill moss on a lawn? All right. So for, for, for me, Vahid, there is a, like Scott's makes a product called Moss X that will work. Uh, dish um, water and dish soap, like Dawn, will also kill a moss. That's another option. But versus, but it's before you go down that route of like looking for a product to actually kill it, what I would spend some time on is figuring out why moss is in your lawn in the first place. Because really, any of those products, even like the home remedies using dish soap and water or using like an actual product that's designed to target moss like, um, like moss x they're really a band-aid if you don't change the conditions that are causing moss to be a problem in the first place so moss tends to like low ph soils so more soils that are more acidic it also tends to like uh shaded areas and it also tends to like um damp areas so so shade wet and acidic soil. So the way you can figure out if you have acidic soil is with one of these guys, the soil test kit. This will tell you, you take one take one of these guys along with a probe, you get your soil kit sample, you, your soil sample, you send it in, a week later you're gonna get an email saying, hey, here are your results, and it's gonna tell you what the pH of your soil is. If it's low, meaning if it's below 5.8, then you need to add lime to, to raise the pH up. Like raising the pH to the zone that is optimal for grass is bad for moss. Like moss doesn't like um, more alkaline soils. So that's that's thing one. But in but in addition to your pH being in the optimal area, uh, most people that have moss issues, it's the other two that are, that are a big part of it is like an area where water settles, meaning you're not it's not draining or it's heavily shaded. So if you can improve the drainage of that area, either by building it up a little bit, maybe getting like doing like a light top dress in that area to kind of build it up to where water doesn't settle, or you can reduce the amount of shade. So if you've got like a lot of shrubs or like a tree that's that's um, heavily shading the area, and you can do to get more sunlight down to that area will also help. And then once you 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 change the environmental conditions, now when you go out and you get like your water and dish soap or you get the Moss X product and I'll, I'll actually, I'll find it here and I'll send it to you. Um, that now you're, now it's going to be more effective, right? Like you're going to, you're going to get, you're going to get the benefits of it and they're, and they're going to stick versus having to get out there and, um, and just chase your tail where you're, you're playing a game of whack-a-mole where it goes away for a little while and then it, and then it comes back. So I wanted to give you a better answer versus just saying, Hey, go buy this and apply it because it's really not going to fix the problem. Uh, if you don't change the conditions that are causing moss to be there in the first place. All right, so va at Vahid Navi, and this is the Moss um, X product right there. So that, I've got sent you a link there to it. So, but you can you can use that, but just realize it's gonna be a band-aid unless you actually address uh, the conditions um, as well. All right, um, let's see. Doug says, Mark IV, uh, a Mark IV Supra or BMW Supra, or mean Mark V. Uh, so, so really, the last real Supra was the Mark IV, right? That's the that's a true Toyota Supra. I mean, the Mark V is just sty it's styled by Toyota, but it's really it like the engine management, the engine, like all of it, the drivetrain, all of its all of its BMW. I would say that the it's 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 hard to compare them too, Doug, because you're talking about cars from different eras. Like purely, if your if your criteria is speed handling. Um, then in, in every way that is measurable as far as like zero to 60 time, top speed and handling the Mark five, the Mark five is better. Like the, the, the new Supra is better in pretty much every way. It's a safer car. 
Um, but I would, I mean, but as far as like, a, a, I mean, you talk about like a, the sound, and, and as far as sound goes, they both sound really good. The straight, the, the straight six, the Toyota built was really good. And the, and the, the BMW straight six is a really good sounding engine too. So they both sound really good. It's really, that's kind of down to preference. Um, I don't know, man. It's, it's hard. It's hard to say. One is true. One is truly a Supra. Like the Mark IV is truly a Supra because that's that, in my opinion. The Mark V is an awesome, awesome sports car. It's a better sports car, in my opinion, than the Mark IV, but it's not truly a Supra because it's really a BMW. It's like a Z, Z3 or Z4 or whatever, but that's been reskinned, but it's still an awesome car. So they're both great. They're both great. Um, you're more, I'd say you're more, you're less likely to kill yourself in the Mark V than than the the Mark IV, especially if you if you turn it up. If you take a Mark IV and you you know you you tune it, I mean they're they're a handful. You got to be careful. Whereas the Mark V has all the safety protections. It's easier to drive, and you know. So as far as like a, a tuner car to live with every day, the Mark V is better. So there's that. But it's really down to preference. Okay, um, Ben is up next. He says. We are all here now because we'd rather mow instead of a robot, scalpel versus laser. Manual is the enthusiast choice regardless of other information. Keep mowing two to three times a week, y'all. And I agree. I think I think that's what it is. I mean, here's the thing. In, in, even in 2022, you know, Porsche still sells manual transmission cars. Now, I will say that in many ways we are the minority um, and that will, and probably over time will be even less more so of a minority, but that's already the case. Like most people, most, I, I guarantee you, like most people on your streets, most people that are watching this show right now, most people on your street think you're the crazy person, that you're always out there messing with your lawn, you're always out there mowing it, always spraying it or putting something on it. You're already the crazy person. So you, you are not, we are not the, you, we are not the target demographic for automated mowers. We're just not, because we, we're the, we're like, we're the manual transmission people. We're the, we're the manual transmission people of lawn care. You know what I mean? And we're probably always going to be that way. Um, so, so yeah, but I mean, I think, I think they, they fit a need. They do fit a market, but just not the people that are on this live stream right now, in my opinion. All right. Uh, let's see, or should I say a seven man, two JZ or B, B58? I think the B58 is a better, uh, B58 is a, is a really good engine. B58 is a really, really good engine. They're both great. The 2JZ is, is legendary, but the B58, it's, it's, a, it's a better, it's, it's two different two different errors. You're talking about one that's an iron block and um, you know, just, th just the, the quality of the B58 is better than the quality of the of the 2J. Um, they both can make a ton of power, more power than you can use on the street. So eh, really preference, but I like, I like the B58. It's a great engine. All right, we have a super chat here from Doug, 350Z. Thank you so much, Doug. Super chat. He said, I was sorry, I was asking which one you had, but you said pops and bangs, so you you have the Mark the Mark V. Yeah, I have the Mark V. I don't have a, a, a Mark IV Supra. I don't have um I don't have one of those. I have the Mark V. I have the uh the the B the Zupra, right? So they like to call it like the, the Mark IV people like to say it's not really a Supra, it's a Zupra. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's still faster than your car, so whatever. Stock anyway. I says, okay, so Mike uh, um Anger is up next. He says, will burning your Bermuda when it is dormant before it greens up kill all the weeds that are active and also Poannua? Uh, it'll kill them temporarily, but I don't know that it's going to, it's not going to permanently get rid of them. I mean, you, if you want to prevent weeds from germinating in your lawn, you want to use, you need to use pre-emergent. Like that's it, like, it's, it's going to kill, it'll, it'll, I mean, it, here's, here's an example, right? Here's an answer. Uh, we're we're going to work through this together, Michael. So when you burn your lawn, right? You burn the Bermuda and it looks like it looks like char, like scorched earth, literally. But the Bermuda isn't really dead, right? It grows back. Like it grow it literally grows back like a couple of weeks later, it'll, it'll start to green up again. So the same thing is true for weeds. It's just, I mean, it gets rid of them. Like you're not gonna visually see them anymore, but they're still gonna grow back because you're not you haven't done anything to prevent them from germinating. So if you're trying to keep weeds out of your lawn, uh, burning it, I know some people are a fan of doing that, but that is not, I would not burn your lawn as a means to prevent weeds from being in your lawn. If you want to prevent weeds in your lawn, use pre-emergent. But they but they will get rid of it definitely will get rid of the ones that you're actively seeing, the ones that are that are that are there at the time, but it's not a way to permanently keep weeds out of your lawn. Onk says up next he says, "Hey Ron and everyone, will there be any great deals like Black Friday for last year? I'm working on it, man. I'm working on one. I I, I need to um there I I I I don't know yet. I don't know and I yet. I need to figure out here pretty soon cuz it's going to be it's going to be next week. If there are, 
Um, it will be from um, from Friday until what whatever Cyber Monday is, right? It'll be the weekend. It'll be that weekend. It will not be all week long. It'll be like Friday to Monday type type thing. So I will work on that, sir. Try and get some more traffic and and get you guys a good deal on some um, on some products you can kind of stock up for next year. So yeah, let me work, let me work on that, and you will um, you'll know because that will happen is not only will I it'll be on the live stream I'll announce it next week, but also I'll use social media. So you'll get an email if you're on the mailing list, and if you are subscribed to the YouTube channel, you'll also see um, there'll also be a community post about it as um, as well. So so yeah, working on it like just like there was last year. It'll be it'll be something. Uh, Greg says, what's happening on Thanksgiving for you? Will there be a show on Friday? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be here. So if you guys if you guys want a show on Friday, I mean, but I guess you can all vote right now. Do you guys want the, the ones that are here? Do you guys want a show on Friday? I mean, there's probably not going to be that many people. It might be a short show. It might be only be like an hour, an hour long or whatever. But I mean, if you guys want to have a show, we can we can have one. I'll show up even if it's even if it's uh, even if it's short. All right. So, yeah, the, the plan is that. OK, NMS Otter says the question is POA. Uh, answer is spectacle flow in September, zero POA. Yep, I agree with you. Zero POA this year, and I mean zero. The pro stuff costs, but does the job and goes a long way. So what he's talking about is this product here, spectacle flow. As far as the Mac Daddy product to use on warm season grass for POA, it doesn't get much better than this. Now, it's really expensive and really makes sense only if you have you know a couple of friends to split it with. But it is, as far as keeping Poe out of your lawn, there's not much that's much better than um, than Spectacle. It's really, it's really, really good. Really good product. If you guys are interested in that, I will, um, Spectacle Flow. I will, um, I'll put a link here in the chat for you guys to be able to grab it if you're um, if you're so inclined. But this, again, you're a little bit late in the season, but if, um, if you want to use it in the spring, you can too. So Spectacle and flow there you go so if you guys are interested there is a link to it right there hey demir if you're here i know you're here i just saw you in the other in my other chat window so we had a question earlier about um ultra dwarf bermuda so one of the viewers in the live stream he has a he has a green like a home green and he has ultra dwarf bermuda on it at what temp he he, he, he was asking about um like temperatures of 27 degrees what temperature or, or probably a better answer question is like, what triggers do you guys use to when you guys cover up the greens for the rest of the year? Is it when you start getting a lot of snowfall or is it temperature driven? Like, which is it for you guys when you've been covering the greens on the golf course? Cause he wanted to know when he should start covering his ultra door. I don't have a green, so I don't, I don't really know, but you are here. So I figure I'll throw the question towards you and I'll see what you, what you say in the comment section, if you have time to answer it. All right. Uh, Gary, let's see here. Um, so Gary has a question about, um, or WGZ says, Gary, I would suggest getting the T-Jet attachments for the flow zone. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if that's a great comment, Doug. For your new flow zone, I don't know. I think it's Greg that got it, not Gary. I think it's, is it Gary or Gary? Maybe it's Gary. Okay, so Gary, if you got the the flow, whoever got the, fl the, the flow zone, getting an assortment of, um, of, of T-Jet spray tips is a great idea. You are gonna have to get an attachment, an adapter attachment. I don't, unless flow zone is including them now. When I got mine you know, several years ago, they, they weren't including it but it's gonna allow you to use a proper um, like soil application tip, like a flood jet tip like this. And it'll allow you to it'll also allow you to use a foliar application tip like this. So I would get these guys, they're not expensive. You're talking about maybe 20 bucks all in for both of them. And um, and you, you just need to get the attachment to be able to, to put that on the, the wand of the flow zone. Isaac is saying manual transmission all the way. Slam the likes, fellas. Definitely appreciate that, uh, Isaac. It says best best moss killer is a chainsaw. That's what he's saying. Okay, well, I mean that that could work. That could work. And then Ben says manual versus transmission doesn't matter if GSP yeah if GSP gets you at 124 on the brakes. Ask why no. Yeah, the GSP they tend to, the Georgia State Patrol they don't tend to have too much humor. When it comes to uh, to that triple digits, you probably you probably unless you got unless you're you're a really really good explanation, a really good talker, you're probably leaving in handcuffs. You're probably leaving the scene in handcuffs um, at that at that speed. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, it may lead to hot uh, to obsession. 
Okay, Whiskey Blood, so you know we're chiming, we're chiming down there, so we're talking, we can talk about this. He says, uh, a favorite old school American muscle. Um, uh, Eleanor, the uh, the 69, the fastback, the 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 uh, the, the car in Gone in 60 Seconds, the, um, oh, what's his name? The guy that was in Con Air. Uh, Nicholas Cage, uh, that car, like that, if I had to, ha if I had to have an older one, um, something like that. I, that that would be my um, my thing because they're just they're just cool, you know. I mean, they're not necessarily the fastest, but they're just they're just really cool looking cars. Like GT five, GT um, was it the three? Is it three fifty or five hundred? Whatever. The, you know, you guys know the car I'm talking about. The um, the the fastback. That would be that would be it. I don't even know if I'd even want it to be like authentic. You could even do like um, you could even do like a um, like a resto mod, like a like you know like a like a modern. You could do like a like a, a like having modern engine in it. Um, and electronics, but just having the body and the look of it, I would be cool with that. Kind of like think about like the 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 the, the unicorn, like what Ken Block did, like that kind of car, like that would be cool. Like it just looks cool. It doesn't really matter what's powering it. It just it's a pretty awesome looking car, right? So um, of course I know that's sacrilegious to, to people that are purists, but you ask. That's that would be that would be mine, my choice if I were gonna if I were gonna get one. All right, Michael has another question. He says, uh, one more question. I have been mowing my Bermuda lawn with a rotary mower. I purchased a California trimmer and I was wondering, is it best to use pine needles in my plant beds versus mulch? Your preference. I would not mow either with the mower. I wouldn't mow either. So real mowers real mowers work best and they last longest, the, or the edge, the sharpness of them lasts longest when you cut only grass with them. So, Pine needles are probably a little bit less damaging than mulch, but you really don't want to run over either of them with the mower. You want, you want to only cut grass with the mower if you're trying to keep it sharp for as long as possible. I do mulch because it tends to stay put better for me. I've, I've used to do, I used to do um, pine straw in the past, but um, I find that mulch, mulch one lasts longer. Like you can get away with like one mulch application really for the season, it still looks good. Whereas pine straw, you have to do it a couple of times for it to not look like, you know, you, like, like there's no owner living at the house over the way the, the beds look. So I've, been, I've gone to mulch, but it's really, it's really personal preference. I wouldn't run over either of them with a mower. All right, Gary says, Ron, regarding my flow zone, flow zone sprayer, I have a little competition with my neighbor. Is it bad on garbage day if I leave the box out? <laughs> we can, dude, you're too competitive, man. Is it bad so I can leave the box out so we can see it? No, 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 I mean, not at all. And what you could even do is if you know when they're leaving the house, you could be, you could even go out there and just be on the driveway and just like, you know, making passes with your water, you know, with just watering it, spraying it, just trying to get your, your calibration down, your walking speed down. I mean, if you're really trying to be hardcore, why stop at just putting the box out on the street? Let's, I mean, let's, let's, let's really do it. You know, let's really get to them. So that, that would be, that would be my thing. I mean, the box, yeah, sure, that's that's good. I mean, it's a good start. But I would be out there they're doing a calibration on the driveway and they can see that and they'll be like, man, this guy is like, ugh, I'm never going to be able to beat Gary. This is crazy. That's what you want, right? All right, we got Devin in the house. He says, what's up, Ron? Way late tonight. Yeah, man, no problem. I know you're always busy. I know you're between, you're, you're trying to get married, get the house done and obviously work at the golf course. So I appreciate you coming to hang out, sir. Uh, and if you, had a, if you have time to answer that question, or I'll, I'll probably, I'll, Ping you on um, on the gram later and uh, and ask the question that uh, that was posed about when to cover up the greens, like what you use as a as a signal to do that. Um, but yeah, glad to have you in the in the live stream. And again, we still need to get you on the show again at some point. We've been saying that like all year, but I'm starting to lose faith that it's going to happen this year. All right, Ben says most of here seem to like gear and mechanical stuff. Still think you should do an off season stream show to show showcase all our your lawn gear. Lawn, awesome lawn is possible to do with one $50 mower, keep mowing. I could do that. I could, you know, I haven't done a live stream outside in a while. So I could do one where I just bring out, I take out, I mean, it's a lot of work. Take all the lawn gear out, all the lawn equipment out and do a live stream talking about all that. It's like, hey, this is all the stuff that I'm using and that kind of thing. I could do that. I mean, it'll be, it'll be a short one. I mean, we can do, take questions about it and that kind of thing. But yeah, we could, I could, do, I could make that happen before it gets too cold. Not this weekend though. Um, not this weekend, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah, I can, I can work in, work on making that happen, Ben. I've been wanting to get, I've been wanting to take my camera gear outside anyway and take my streaming setup outside and just kind of play around anyway. So that'll be, give me a good reason, uh, to do it. Right. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Ben has a couple of other comments. He says, most of us are obsessed. Good off-season content. I only have five mowers, LOL. Only five. Wow. 
Uh, we need excuses to justify this stuff. You don't need excuses other than you just want it. I mean, so wait, hang on a second. So you want me to do that so that you can be like, hey, hon, look, look at Ron. He's has like two, he has like three mowers and, you know, all this other stuff. And I've only got the five and, you know, you, you, I'm sure you'll be able to go through some kind of math as to why, like what you're doing is actually saving, is actually uh, the more responsible approach and less expensive approach than what I'm doing. You're trying, I see what's going on. You're trying to make me the scapegoat. I see, I, I, I see, I see what you're, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. Uh, Daryl votes for Friday night. He says, I'll be home uh, to chat on the live stream. Um, I work at night, so I'll just be listening. Okay, no problem. Well, that, the plan is for next Friday. And uh, yep, that was good. He says, thanks for looking into attachments. Um, no, they are not included. You only get the tips with the power washer. Okay, no worries. And um, 100 Yard Alchemist says, um, I can answer that pine straw is better for plants that need acidic soil while mulch is better for plants that require general fertilizer, like a 13, 13, 13. Okay, that, that, that's a good, that's a good um, point, um, 100 yard alchemist. I didn't, I didn't think about it from that perspective. When he mentioned the real mower, I was thinking in the context of, of what is gonna be more damaging to the equipment. And the answer is both of them, but really the pine, uh, the, um, the mulch is gonna be more damaging because it's literally like little pieces of bark, right? That you're running over. So that's, that's a lot harder on the mower than pine, than pine needles. So there is, um, there's that. And by the way, that's right, it's a good point. Ben Rahan, we gotta clap it up. Thank you, Ben. We do have to clap it up for Michael getting the California trimmer. We do. Moving to real mowing. It's a good point. Thank you for the call out. Mm -hmm. And guys, gals, I think that is it. I'm looking here and that is the last comment, last question, last thing that we have for tonight. So we're gonna knock off a little bit early tonight. I know only like two and a half hours or so, which is for us is pretty short, but um, it's that time of the year. So between now and next week, you guys can look forward to um, to, a, to a, a sale on the store. And you can also look forward just to more content. I, I've got some questions, some research topics that we have for, for that. And looks like, oh, Devin just timed in. He says, we just covered our greens this week. We usually time um, we 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 time it usually with a blowout. More important to cover it um, when the play stops on them, which is about three weeks ago. Just get them covered before the ground is. Um, I guess he's going to say before the ground is frozen. Um, I'm thinking that's what he's what he's what he's saying. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So um, if you are still here, Golf Castle, I think that was what your name was, and you wanted to, to you know cover your greens. It, it sounds like now would be. Now you're you're in the window for doing it. it sounds like this one. I mean, Devin and them have already uh, have already done theirs. Granted, they are in Colorado Springs, so I imagine it's colder than where you are. But it sounds like you wouldn't be crazy to, to cover yours now if you wanted to. All right, he says, yeah, completely. Um, he says, yeah, he says. So uh, the, the last part of his comment is, just get them covered before the ground is completely frozen. And you can't get the metal spike, um, and you can't get the metal spikes in to secure them for the winter. And absolutely, we'll be back on your live as soon as possible. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. No worries. So yeah, so there you go. You have your answer, uh, Golf Castle. If you um, if you're here, and what I'm gonna do is I'll just screenshot Devin's comments. So I'll have both of them just to be able to say, hey, look, there's a guy that actually takes care of greens for a living, and this is what he says to do. And there you go. So cover them before the ground's frozen. Sounds good to me. Sounds like a plan to me. Well, guys, gals, again, thanks again. I appreciate all the love and support. Devin, thanks for coming to show up. Better late than never. You came in to save the day as far as giving the question on the greens. I'll work with you and seeing if we can get you back on the live stream would be great. And everyone else, if you don't have anything else for me, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Take care. And we will talk next week. Have an amazing weekend.